Well, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our 1 p.m. public portion of the closed litigation session of the March 26, 2019 meeting of the City Council. In this part of the meeting, the council will receive public testimony. Thereafter, council members will move to the courtyard conference room for the closed session. I would like to ask our clerk to please call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council member Crone is absent. Glover is absent. Meyer? Here. Brown? Here. Matthews? Here. Vice Mayor Cummings? Here. And Mayor Watkins? Here. Are there any members of the public who would like to speak um, to any of the items on our closed session agenda? I see none. Okay, so hearing none, I will adjourn this meeting to our courtyard conference room, unless we have a statement from our city I have attorney. a brief announcement. Okay. The uh, significant exposure to litigation item on this afternoon's agenda relates to uh, a potential litigation in connection with the planned closure of the Ross encampment. Okay. Thank you for that uh, clarification. Okay, so at this point, I will adjourn this meeting to the courtyard conference room where we'll go into our closed session. <laughs> We'll go ahead and get started. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our 315 session of the March 26, 2019 meeting of the Santa Cruz City Council. I'd like to ask our clerk to please call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council Member Crone is absent. Glover is absent. Myers? Here. Brown? Here. Matthews? Here. Vice Mayor Cummings? Here. And Mayor Watkins? Here. Before we begin today, I'd like to ask that we please take a moment of silence to honor the victims of the horrific attacks at the two mosques in New Zealand on March 15th. Thank you. Mayor? If I could, I'd like to say that I attended the vigil of solidarity that was held on Friday at noon at the Islamic Center. And um, Chief Mills, if he's here, um, did speak as well. There were a number of speakers, hundreds of people attended, um, complete array of faiths, community organizations, individual. It was a very, very moving gathering, and it was deeply appreciated by the local Islamic community. So um, I just wanted to let you and the rest of the community know that. Thank you. Okay, at this point, we'll go ahead and move forward with our uh, Pledge of Allegiance. And if the clerk, clerk could please. I pledge allegiance to the United States of America and So at this time, we have an opportunity to uh, have some introductions of new employees. So we'll go ahead and ask that we have our Director of Economic Development, Bonnie Lipscomb, uh, come up first. Good afternoon, Mayor and members of the Council. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Tiffany Lake um, to you today. Tiffany is our new Principal Management Analyst in the Housing Division, and she's been here a month and a half, a month and a half already, and she has already, she's such a part of our team. We're so excited she's here. Um, she actually first moved here um, in 1999 to go to UCSC, and she finished with a master's in business administration with an accounting specialty, which has come into um, great use already. Um, she also has great project management skills and software skills, and um, she worked for uh, HSC from 2009 to 2012, 
and um, definitely has sort of really jumped right in, taken on um, already, uh, cleaned up a lot of things, has some great ideas for housing monitoring and some software that we're pretty excited about, uh, jumped into CDBG, um, some other um, processes that, that we have going. Uh, Tiffany loves cooking. We've all already tasted her fabulous chicken mole, um, <laughs> which we love, um, and loves cooking cuisines from around the world, um, loves to do roasted salads, different things like that. Her favorite thing about Santa Cruz is a mix of redwoods and ocean all in one place and nature, and loves to walk her dogs and get out, um, and she does have rescue dogs as well. Um, favorite thing about work, she loves the people. Um, she loves and the passion and the incredible energy um, that we have at the city. And so um, again, she's just been such a welcome part of our team. M one thing she'd really like to change, um, and this won't surprise you, is more affordable housing, and she's definitely already working on it. Um, and one thing that she finds challenging that she'd really like to do, which we all also support, is she'd really like to streamline and make our department paperless. Um, so we're gonna be working with her on that. Um, she also has, prior to working at the city, um, some background in that she was consulted while she was working at HSC by former mayor and council member Don Lane to be a presenter at one of his classes at UCSC um, about homelessness and homeless um, awareness. And she pre uh, pre presented on the prevention and rapid rehousing um, during that time that she was at HSC. So um, please join me in welcoming Tiffany. Welcome Tiffany. Here. Thank you, Bonnie. Welcome to the city. No, I, I just figured out HSC is Homeless Services Center, correct? Yeah, got it. <laughs> Welcome to the city of Santa Cruz, Tiffany. We'll now invite up Deputy Director of Water Operations Manager Chris Coburn to introduce uh, his new employee. <clears throat> Good afternoon, Mayor Watkins, council members. I'd like to introduce Nick Nunez. He is a new uh, ranger assistant who will be working up at Loch Lomond. I think many of you know that the water department manages Loch Lomond both for water supply as well as the environmental resources that we have at the lake and recreation. So it's a very sort of complex, multidisciplinary job. And Nick brings to it, I think, a wealth of experience and education. He has a degree in philosophy from UC Santa Cruz, which is what brought him here in 2015. He's originally from West Los Angeles. Um, he also has a minor in earth system or earth sciences. So all of that work and experience, I think is really gonna uh, be, set him in a good position to uh, do great things up at the lake. And then also his dad uh, ran a tree trimming company down in Los Angeles too, which is, as we know, something that we're always experiencing up there, needs of uh, management of the forest. So uh, Nick in his spare time enjoys surfing, long distance swimming, and uh, learning new things. So we're really happy to have him with us and welcome Nick. Yeah, welcome Nick. Thank you very much and welcome. So at this time, we'll move into our presentations. And the first uh, presentation we have is Red Cross Month and a proclamation. And I'd like to invite up uh, Dane and our very own uh, Rick Martinez uh, to share a few words. Dane couldn't make it, and since I'm obviously in the neighborhood, I'll be <laughs> representing the Red Cross today. <laughs> Uh, Rick Martinez, your Deputy Chief of Police, as you mentioned. I'm also a, a past board chair and current uh, board member uh, for the Central Coast Chapters of the American Red Cross, and that includes San Benito, uh, Santa Cruz, and Monterey Counties. Uh, the Red Cross, as you know, is a national organization that responds out to natural disasters, uh, coordinates uh, blood supply, also military communication, and uh, what was the other thing? Uh, oh, and obviously, um, fire response. So uh, the Red Cross has been there for us as a community, uh, whether it's earthquakes, wildland fires, um, tsunamis, uh, water spouts, uh, and a little bit of everything. So uh, it's an organization that does a lot of great work in our community. There's uh, 450 uh, men and women uh, that volunteer in, in our uh, Central Coast region. And it is the most active volunteer corps in the nation. If there is a disaster, whether it's uh, national or worldwide, uh, you can pretty much uh, be assured that one of the Central Coast volunteers will be deployed and be there at one of those scenes. Uh, I guess uh, a great example of that is even airline disasters. Uh, the 
uh, Asiana flight, when that went down at, uh, in San Francisco, I actually heard about it first uh, through the Red Cross because we sent teams there uh, to coordinate a reunification center and also uh, deal with the, uh, the, uh, the attendants or the uh, pastors on that flight. So it's, uh, it's an organization that uh, does a lot of great work uh, locally, nationally, and uh, worldwide. So thank you for taking uh, the busy time from your schedule uh, to recognize the great work that the volunteers, mostly, uh, of the Red Cross do uh, in our community and nationwide. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. And um, thank you to the, to the hundreds of volunteers in our community and beyond that support. Um, the health and well-being of folks. I um, have an uh, honor to issue a proclamation declaring uh, this month to be a Red Cross uh, Month. And so I'll read a few elements of it and then I'll go ahead and hand it over. So whereas American Red Cross Month is a special time to recognize and thank our heroes, those Red Cross volunteers and donors who give up their time and resources to help members of the community. And whereas more than 137 years ago, the American Red Cross was established as a humanitarian organization guided by seven fundamental principles, including humanity, impartiality, and independence to provide services to those in need, regardless of race, religion, gender, sexual orientation, or citizenship status. Mm -hmm. And I'll just end by saying um, that therefore I, Martine Watkins, as mayor of the city of Santa Cruz, do hereby proclaim the month of March 2019 as Red Cross Month in the city of Santa Cruz and encourage all citizens to join me in supporting this organization and its noble humanitarian mission. So here you go. Thank you, Mayor. Just a brief side note where you're walking up. You mentioned 137 years of service nationally. Uh, our local chapter is actually just about 120 years. So it's one of the first 11 chapters in the nation. So it's uh, quite of an interesting fact. So I thought I'd throw that out there. Thank you, take care. So next up is a 30 year service pin recognition for Renee Belling. And I'll ask that Susan Nimitz and Janice O'Driscoll uh, please come up to make the presentation. Thank you, I'm Susan Nemitz, and this is Janice and Renee. Hey, hi, Renee. Good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> um, we're so excited to be here. Renee's been with us for 30 years. She started in Scotts Valley part-time, went on to Branza 40, and now is a leader in our collection management services organization. I wanna give you this beautiful pin recognizing your 30 years of service. She's in charge of our media, cataloging, processing, mending, and you can imagine her job's changed a lot over the years. Um, we're just so happy to have her with her and we really wanna recognize the service that she's provided to the Santa Cruz Public Libraries. Janice, do you wanna say anything? It's always amazing when someone is willing to give you 30 years of their life to your institution. We've been so lucky to have Renee. She does the kind of work that is behind the scenes. Nobody thinks about how those pieces of media get on the shelf or how we keep track of them, but Renee is the way that we do it. And the other thing that I'm always grateful for is because at Christmas there's fudge. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just thrilled that you've spent 30 years with us. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you so much, Renee. Thank, Thank you. you for letting us recognize of course. Did you want to say a few words also, Renee? You're welcome to, no pressure. When, when she said my job has changed over the years, when I first started, we had audio cassettes and video cassettes. <laughs> and we were just starting to actually catalog video cassettes because at that time when we first started getting them we weren't sure that they were going to continue so we actually had them numbered it was video cassette one when we hit the mid 1000s we said we've actually got to catalog them so that we put them under dewey and now of course we have no more audio tapes we have no more videotapes it's all cd and now it's going to streaming and downloading 
and things have changed quite a bit. Not sure if it's for the better or not, but <laughs> things have changed a lot. And I'm glad I got to see it with the city of Santa Cruz. Well, thank you for your 30 years of service thank amongst you. all thank that you. change. Of course. So now I'd like to invite up uh, Suzanne Healy uh, to introduce the next presentation, which is the O'Neill Sea Odyssey Highlights. Hi, good afternoon, Mayor Watkins and City Council members. I'm Suzanne Healy, Associate Planner with the Public Works Department. And as you might know, both the City Public Works and Water Departments have contributed funding to the amazing O'Neill Sea Odyssey education programs for many years. Thus, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Mr. Dan Hipley, who is the outgoing Executive Director. He just recently retired last week. And the new Executive Director, Ms. Rachel Kippen, and they're gonna do the presentation for us. So thank you. Mayor Watkins, Council Members, uh, it's my great pleasure to be here today. I am the former Executive Director of O'Neill Sea Odyssey. Happy to say, and I'm really happy to introduce Rachel Kippen to you today. She previously worked at the City of Watsonville doing environmental projects. Before that, she was the Program Manager at Save Our Shores. And um, before I hand the, uh, hand the lectern over to her, I just wanna say thank you for all of the efforts that the City of Santa Cruz has undertaken to support support O'Neill Sea Odyssey, this council, the staff, uh, all the efforts, including Measure E, uh, stormwater funding uh, mechanism in 2008. Also, this city has taken a leadership role in the fight uh, to protect the ocean, starting with the mid-1980s, uh, with the effort to basically spark a seagrass rebellion that 26 other communities participated in, aimed at onshore facilities for offshore oil. Uh, uh, combating the, the uh, choking plastic pollution in the ocean as well as uh, dealing with ocean acidification, which is a, is a, a outcome of climate change. So all of that that you've done, thank you. And um, with O'Neill Sea Odyssey, we're very pleased to be able to help create the next generation of, of community stewards and environmental stewards in the city of Santa Cruz and elsewhere. So it gives me, gives me great pleasure to um, uh, introduce Rachel Kippen. <laughs> Good afternoon, honorable council members. I'm so proud to stand here today and, and call myself the executive director of O'Neill Sea Odyssey. It's the first time I've ever said that on a presentation. So <laughs> I'm just really excited. So thank you so much for, uh, for hearing me this afternoon. We are going to go through kind of a brief overview of our partnership, O'Neill Sea Odyssey and the city of Santa Cruz and what we've done over the past several, you know, over a decade. Um, and I really appreciate your support. Not playing on this. Oh. No. Okay. So I'm hope I think several of you have gotten to come out on the O'Neill Sea Odyssey program, but for those of you who haven't yet, um, please, please reach out. There is opportunity to shadow the program. Uh, Mayor Watkins is gonna be joining us in June. Um, O'Neill Sea Odyssey looks at uh, the ocean as a science classroom. Um, it is our mission to provide a hands-on educational experience to encourage the protection and preservation of our living sea and communities. And we do that both on the water and then working alongside teachers, both in their classroom and then at our Shoreside Education Center. We primarily engage fourth through sixth grade elementary students and middle school students in three major areas, ocean navigation, ocean and watershed ecology, and marine science. So our students come to our program, they rotate through those three stations, both on Team O'Neill's catamaran, um, and again at our Shoreside Education Center in the harbor. Each class is required to complete a community service project to join our program. And while our program is entirely free, um, we use that as a way to incentivize and encourage our students to participate um, in their community service. And in the city of Santa Cruz, we've seen so many different community service projects with our local schools, anything from beach cleanups to recycling campaigns on their campus um, to the incubation of steelhead um, for our San Lorenzo River. Um, it's been a beautiful partnership there. 
We also have had a special relationship with Save Our Shores, where um, through the funding, through part of the funding through City of Santa Cruz, uh, Save Our Shores will do a food web, um, kind of marine debris activity on the same day as our students will go out on the boat. Um, and they'll also do a beach cleanup and then directly follow that up with programs with us so they can really see that connection. Most of our students have never been on the ocean. And while that, um, that number is a bit different in the city of Santa Cruz because we do have coastal <coughs> access here, um, we do still see a lot of students that are coming out and have never been on a boat before. I and mean, we're so grateful to be able to provide them with that experience. We also use the uh, USDA free and reduced lunch uh, numbers to help us determine need from our local schools. So it, our schools do apply for the program um, and we're able to uh, determine both kind of if the school would have resources to do these kinds of programs and also if the school might need help with transportation. Um, we do provide bus scholarships as well. our partnership with the city of Santa Cruz. We serve 12 classes every single year, uh, 360 youth total. Um, and we have partnered since the year 2000. Uh, funds coming both um, from the refuse and recycling, water funds and stormwater funds. Um, and then we increased our funding uh, through the passage of Measure E, which Dan Hafley was involved in. I'm very helpful um, to get that, that funding mechanism going for several of our local nonprofits. Uh, and we're able to um, have served over 4,800 students um, in over 160 classes that otherwise would not have gotten this program without that support. So I want to thank you for your support today. And I also wanted to invite you, hopefully you all already received an invitation to Dan Hafley's retirement celebration on April 11th at the Sunroom in Coconut Grove. Uh, it's from five to 7.30. Cynthia Matthews has been very helpful on the planning committee. And I brought some flyers and invitations for you to post if, if you wouldn't mind. So thank you again so much. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much for the presentation. And I'd just like to take a moment um, to uh, acknowledge and thank uh, Dan Hafley for his exceptional work over the years as the executive director of O'Neill Sea Odyssey, which has educated, as we just heard, thousands of local school children on marine science and environmental topics. The O'Neill Sea Odyssey program provides an unforgettable learning experience for school classes out on the Monterey Bay. And for many kids, as we heard today, it's their first time out on a boat and hopefully not their last. We'd also like to congratulate Dan on his recent retirement as executive director of O'Neill Sea Odyssey. As of this month, we heard we have Rachel taking over. And, and just so you all know, Dan was hired nearly 20 years ago by Jack O'Neill. Um, to run the O'Neill Sea Odyssey program. And during his time, O'Neill Sea Odyssey accomplished a major milestone of having 100,000 elementary students participate in this unique ocean going science and environmental program. Dan also oversaw fundraising to renovate the O'Neill building at the Santa Cruz Harbor and include an education center for students. Thank you so much, Dan, for your extraordinary work that you've done in our community. It's been an honor to par partner with you on behalf of the city. Just want to thank the city again. It's really started here and uh, really appreciate all your work. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. And welcome, Rachel. Thank you. And Councilmember Matthews. Dan is too modest to say this, but uh, he was the one who really led the campaign to um, um, uh, ban oil drilling uh, as much as possible along the California coast, very influential in establishment of the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary, as well as Safe Our Shores and O'Neill Sea Odyssey, all these things. He's collecting accolades everywhere he looks <laughs> this month. <laughs> and <laughs> and um, he also, I think some of you know, um, recently published a book called, is it 40 Years Saving the Coast? Um, uh, published locally. So it's an amazing history of of 
four decades of the uh, political organizing, advocacy, and uh, implementation uh, work behind um, ocean protection here in California and Monterey Bay. Thank you. Thank you for your past work and for organizing and supporting the next generation. Absolutely. All right, thank you. So at this point, um, we'll go ahead and um, move on to a few announcements that I have. First, I'd like to announce that today is Council Member Meyer's birthday. Happy birthday. <laughs> <laughs> it's off script a little bit. But, uh, that's my first announcement. <laughs> Thank you for serving our community and being here with us on your birthday. Um, I have a few additional amount announcements and then we'll move, move on to our regular meeting. So today's meeting is being broadcast live on community television, channel 25, and streaming on the city's website at thecityofsantacruz.com. Mike Oliphant, and I'm sorry if I mispronounced your last name, is our technician for both this afternoon and later this evening, and I'd like to thank him for his work. He's here before we get here and they stay after, so thank you, Mike, for your work. Um, all city council members can be emailed at the city, city council at cityofsantacruz.com. If you would like to communicate with us about an agenda item, we'd like to receive your email by Monday at 5 p.m. before our council meeting. This provides us with an oppor opportunity to review your email and include it with the rest of our agenda packet. Please do bear in mind that all items of correspondence with the city and the city council constitute public records and are generally subject to disclosure upon request by any member of our public. Accordingly, if you have any sensitive or private information that you do not wish to be made public, you should not include that information in your correspondence. Our rules of decorum are on the window ledge to my left, and it's my job as mayor to keep the meeting running without disruption. And we ask that we all uh, and you all respect each other and our fellow citizens when we are inside and outside of our council chambers. So at this time, I'd like to ask if there are any statements of disqualification from council members today? No. Nope. Okay. Seeing none. Okay. And I'll go ahead and look to our city clerk administrator to announce any additions or deletions. We don't have any. Okay. I have a brief announcement about oral communications. So oral communications is an opportunity for members of the community to speak to us on items that are not on our agenda. Oral communications will occur at or around 7 p.m. Okay. So I would like to now call on our city attorney to please provide a report on closed session. Thank you, Mayor Watson, members of the city council. <clears throat> we had a busy closed session uh, that commenced at one o'clock this afternoon in the courtyard conference room. First item on the closed session agenda was uh, liability claims. That was the claims of, <coughs> excuse me, Susan Ames Colley, Allstate Northbrook Indemnity Company, Kitty or Giddy Katie Dash Ban and State Farm Insurance. Those are also uh, on your open session agenda as uh, item nine on the consent calendar. There was one uh, item of anticipated litigation that was discussed by the uh, council, received a report from the city attorney's office and, uh, and gave direction. There was no reportable action on, excuse me. There was one item of initiation of litigation uh, in which the council received a report from and directed the city attorney to initiate litigation. Um, the parties and the particulars of that litigation will be available to the public on request um, once the action has been filed and served. There was one item of significant exposure to litigation in which the council received a report from and conferred with the city attorney's office and there was no reportable action on that item. Item D was existing litigation, and that was the case Hatch Pomerantz versus the city of Santa Cruz pending in the Santa Cruz County Superior Court. Um, discussion of that item was deferred until the April 9th meeting. And there were several items of real property negotiations in which the council received a report from and gave instructions to <coughs> its real property negotiator. Properties were 125 Coral Street, owned by James P. Gillespie and Jean Gillespie trustees. Another property, 510 River Street, owned by SPG Associates. Third parcel was 600 River Street, owned by Gateway Plaza Associates, LLC. Fourth parcel, 700 River Street, owned by Summer Solstice, LP. 
5th parcel 808 River Street owned by Richard L. and Tawny Santee trustees. Lastly, a parcel with APN 0081716 no situs address. Um, and that was parcel owned by Richard L. and Tawny Santee trustees. There was no reportable action on those items. Okay, thank you, Tony. So um, I'll go ahead and move our agenda along to item number four. And this is a time for council members to report out on any actions at external boards, committees, and joint power authority meetings. For future meetings, um, please do come prepared to provide an update on any meetings or actions that occurred since the last council meeting so that the council and public can be um, informed. And I will go ahead and start to my left. Councilmember Matthews, if you have any report outs. Oh, a couple of quick yeah. updates. Um, I sit on the Metro uh, Transit District Board with Councilmember Myers, and uh, just a couple of interesting issues. Um, they're always in the search for drivers, um, uh, have a challenge keeping those slots filled. It's uh, like many other <laughs> jobs, there's an extensive training, uh, recruitment and training um, program. Uh, they are adding more varieties of buses, so with the um, um, a variety of buses, electrical and CNG, the the um, uh, double buses that they re recently acquired that requires more training. Um, so if you know anyone who wants to be a bus driver, send them to Metro, they're hiring. Um, also, um, a continual scramble and uncertainty about uh, federal funding. Metro's a capital intensive operation and um, um, big unknown, so they're doing a, a lobbying trip back to DC that Alex, uh, the exec, is heading back. Um, I'd say those are a couple of highlights. Um, on the Mid-County Groundwater Agency, that's our collaborative with um, others, um, Central, Soquel Creek, and some private well owners, um, making progress on the uh, groundwater sustainability plan, which we have to deliver um, in a, a couple of years. And um, doing, we got reports on the research. Uh, there's some pretty intense enrichment sessions going on for the separate members of that group. It's one of those things that um, does not operate in the public eye, but is doing really, really good uh, work that will lead us to a sustainable uh, water groundwater uh, program well into the future. So I'd say um, those are the a couple. Um, Donna, you can report on the downtown management. Yeah. Thanks, Mayor Cummings. Great, so um, reporting back on the last local agency formation committee meeting. Um, the staff brought forward a proposed budget on March, on March 6th and set a public hearing to adopt a final budget on April 3rd, 2019. However, due to conflicts and based on the chair's direction, um, the next LAFCO meeting date has been uh, moved to May 1st. Um, there was also discussion about the Aptos, La Selva, and Central Fire Protection Districts. Um, they've been taking action to functionally consolidate some of their operating units. So after an initial 90-day trial period, they were able to extend the trial period um, by 180 days during August of 2018, which allowed for the opportunity to identify changes, initiate enhancements, and evaluate results of the division and battalion chief's duties, thus providing an efficient and effective model for moving forward with the, um, with the merger and the, co the consolidation of these fire districts. In addition to LAFCO, um, an update on the Association of Monterey Bay Area Governments. Um, there were a couple presentations that took place. One was a presentation on um, Big Sur District 5 and Highway 1 improvements, and so it focused on the Highway 1 corridor plan, and a couple uh, questions they were trying to address were, how do visitors fit within the corridor plan and address visitor demand and experience? And they also had questions around um, what are viable alternatives to driving as we're seeing increases in visitation to uh, Big Sur. One of the things I identified is the need for more restrooms and that uh, crashes are lower than the state average, but there's some serious areas of concern where they have um, crashes uh, in that area. In addition to uh, the Highway improvements in the Highway court, 1 corridor plan. There's also a presentation on the 2045 Metropolitan Transit Plan and uh, Sustainable Community Strategies. And this focused on regional growth, um, the regional growth forecast, looking to forecasting gro growth in, our, in this region out from 2015 to 2045. Um, it's based on growth 
forecast models used by local jurisdictions. And um, two factors that they're looking at is um, growth in housing and employment in city, metropolitan areas, and within the county. And it's anticipated that this report is gonna come out this fall. Um, they also mentioned the regional housing needs assessment. Last year, uh, and this is uh, the acronym for this is RENA. So last year, RENA numbers weren't part of the um, Metropolitan Transit Plan Sustainable Community Strategies Plan. However, there have been new laws passed in the state in the past year, um, and these RENA numbers um, are go going to have some impacts on affordable housing in terms of funding that local jurisdictions will be able to receive. Um, and so remembering back to two meetings ago here at the City Council, uh, these RENA numbers um, look at how jurisdictions are meeting the needs of producing very low, low, moderate, and above moderate housing, and um, anticipated reproductions for jurisdictions that don't meet their arena numbers may have implications and uh, may be tied to them being able to receive more funds for affordable housing. May I just say for members of the public, uh, RENA stands for Regional Housing Need assessment, so that is related to the number of um, housing units that each local jurisdiction um, is assigned as part of the goal and then um, measured against what we produce, construct within those jurisdictions, just so people know what RENA means. Thank you for that clarification. And on that note, we'll go ahead and go over to you, uh, Councilman Brown, for any updates. If any. Um, sure, I'll give a brief update uh, from the Seniors Council, the Area Agency on Aging. Their last meeting, we received a legislative agenda. There are, I think, setting a record of the number of pieces of legislation that have been introduced in this um, Cal the state legislative session. Overall, it's like, I don't remember how many thousand, but it was um, we, a new record, um, many of which are related to uh, services and uh, program policy and funding related to um, services for seniors. So we're tracking some of those pieces of legislation and I will send uh, that to the mayor so you have a, an overview of what those are. I may ask the council to sign on in support of several of those key pieces of legislation because they could provide some significant funding for the first time in, in decades for senior services statewide. It would mean a lot to um, our, our region as well. And with we, the regional transportation uh, commission met, we, I think I reported our last meeting, we've approved our unified corridor um, investment study and are moving forward with that. We are at our last meeting heard about um, updates related to the northern uh, North Coast segment of the the rail line and um, I don't have anything ex you know nothing new necessarily to report other than uh, working with the North Coast farmers to ensure that um, acquisition well, we've acquired the rail line but any uh, uses and kind of development of the the rail corridor um, are compatible with their needs so that seems to all be going relatively smoothly um, and uh, that was kind of a New, good news for us. Um, we also, some of you may have heard, we're um, uh, facing a lawsuit by uh, Greenway related to the rail corridor um, that um, a judge dismissed that lawsuit. So we are proceeding with the preferred scenario that the commission uh, supported, which includes maintenance of the rail line in addition to development of uh, a trail along that corridor. And um, within the city, we've looked at the segments that are kind of coming online, or they will be over the next couple of years. Um, but the North Coast is now um, pretty short up and we're turning our sights south uh, to look at some major repairs that need to be done around, along that end of the line. Thank you, Councilor Brown. Uh, I just had a quick update on the library board. Sure. Mm -hmm. So the library board mess last met on March 7th. Uh, the focus, the main focus of that meeting was we had uh, Marcus uh, Pimentel, our finance director, do an update on the budget and revenues and really the forecast looking ahead at the library system. And uh, like the city and other agencies, the library also too is facing some budget deficits. A uh, variety of reasons for that, a little different than ours, certainly increasing costs is one of them. But the other is that uh, because the library system is growing, 
with respect to square footage with the addition of expanded library spaces, the staffing for the library will have to increase to accommodate the additional capacities that are, that are being built in over the next few years. And so the combination of the two have this uh, increasing deficit. And so that was kind of the introductory to the forecast uh, before we get to adopting the budget this year, uh, coming year. And uh, we'll be discussing then how different ways to try to address that, including we'll have to relook at the funding formulas that uh, we have in place currently. Uh, both, uh, well, the county has a cap on their momentums of effort contributions from the library fund, and the city has a sort of a capped increase in our funding. So we'll have to look at that whole funding formula and bring that back in order to address that, that deficit. So we'll bring that back to the council here probably in the next year uh, as we work out how to address that deficit. Uh, I'll report out on the Downtown Management Corporation and then the Cowles Working Group. Uh, so the DMC, we met last week and um, we adopted the budget and the work plan for the year. Uh, and a lot of that is focused on the Downtown Ambassador Program, which uh, was restarted by the um, DMC last year. Um, we got a detailed report on all the various activities of the ambassadors. It's growing um, very successfully. Um, and, and helping a lot with not only um, visitor services, but also sort of helping to identify built environment needs immediately in the downtown before, um, you know, so things can get fixed and serviced quickly. So um, the ambassador programs, I believe, operates with two or three part-time people and one full-time person and another kind of administrator. So a small group that does a lot of work in the downtown. And um, one of their big uh, focuses and investments this year will be putting in dog stations, um, not for dogs, but for, you know, what dogs do downtown. Um, so one, one, uh, one situation that was revealed in some of the uh, survey work they've done is just the need to have more available pet station um, cleanup stations. So those will be installed, four of those will be installed downtown very soon. <laughs> Uh, we got an update also the, on the FIT program, uh, which is a partnership between the county sheriff's office's office and our police department in terms of um, managing some of the, um, just managing some of the um, uh, uh, issues downtown and uh, again, just getting to know a little bit more about how um, we can align goals in our downtown with visitor um, visitor experience with, with some of the other um, uh, experiences that people do have downtown. So again, the, the program really is, is looking at trying to uh, keep both merchants and visitors informed and um, work towards a cooperative approach to keeping downtown um, as accessible to everyone. And uh, so that program is making good progress as well. Uh, and then uh, the Cows Working Group meeting, met last uh, month as well, or earlier this month. And uh, the Cows Working Group, for those of you who are not familiar with it, is uh, run in partnership with the Save the Waves um, organization. And it was formed to really improve the water quality at Cows Beach, which has been um, listed on the um, Beach Bummers list uh, for the state of California for a number of years. Um, we're working with a variety of water quality scientists, both within the city departments as well as um, universities to really understand the water quality uh, issues at Cal's Beach. And they're uh, complex and, uh, and complicated to, um, to, to basically uh, define, but we're making great progress in the last few years. We've gone from really number one to, I think we're at number seven or eight now. So we're moving down the list, which is great. The goal this year for the working group is really to get off the list altogether. So it's an ambitious goal, but um, with the alignment of various water quality testing procedures, um, as well as continued public education and and uh, infrastructure improvements at the wharf area and the beach area, uh, they're very confident that we're gonna move hopefully off that list, list if not this year, then next year. Um, there will be a film that's gonna be produced about the work um, with Cowles Beach uh, in partnership with Save the Waves and the, and the working group. And that'll be an effort also to just educate um, uh, the public about this effort through the city of Santa Cruz and its partners um, and really the, um, the uh, great work that our public works team and others have done to really improve this really important beach in California. It's one of the most highly visited beaches. And so 
um, they're gonna be looking and trying to get that produced um, by late spring, early summer. So that's it. Thank you. Um, so I'll just briefly say that we have um, an item on health and all policies in the sense mm -hmm. these work, so I won't go into that. And then a number of um, committee meetings uh, that'll be scheduled in the next couple of weeks. But the one I will report on is the uh, Farmers Market Board of Directors meeting that took place last night. Um, there was a conversation about the uh, vision for downtown and um, just essentially where the farmers market fits in that vision and their commitment to continuing to engage with the city on um, uh, the, the sustainability of the farmer's market. And, um, and then also recognition of the weather and how that's impacted the various farmer's markets um, and their ability to offer their services in uh, a very rainy season this year. Um, so with that, I think I'll go ahead and uh, <laughs> conclude this part of the report out. And um, if there's any other things that were forgotten, we can go ahead and uh, send that via email if, if that makes sense. So thank you to uh, the council members who are out there doing the work uh, in the community beyond your time here um, on the dais. Uh, so we'll go ahead and move right along to our consent agenda. So first up, we'll have uh, the items that are listed as five through 14 on our agenda. And all items will be acted upon in one motion unless an item is pulled by a council member for further discussion. And I'd like to ask if uh, city manager Martin Bernal would first like to make a statement in regards to a particular item. Yes, with respect to item number seven, the local cannabis equity grant program, just like to request that the council, when you approve this, uh, make a uh, clarification here, um, under the recommendation, the second portion, it says approve the grant application for an, for the amount of 100,000, and we'd like that to be modified to for the amount of 100,000 or more. 100,000 is a minimum, and uh, the intent wasn't to, to cap it at 100,000, the intent was to get as much funding as possible, so that makes it clear. And then in the resolution, uh, I think it's under the third item on the resolution three, again, there to say authorizes the city manager to accept if awarded a grant in the amount of 100,000 or more from the state of California. So great. if you could just incorporate that into your recommendation, that would be great. Thank you. So we'll go ahead and ask that that be incorporated into any motion that is um, brought forward in regards to that consent item. At this point, are there any council members who wish to pull any items? If so, could you please let me know which item you'd like to have pulled? Councilmember Brown? Um, items eight and 14. I was gonna ask eight, question. but we're okay. Good. okay. Yeah, I just have a question. Yeah, if on that one too. Okay. Uh, any items to be pulled on this side? I have a quick comment at the right time. Okay, so we have items number eight and 14 uh, pulled from the consent. Um, is there any uh, council members who wish to only con comment on any of the items other than eight or 14? Councilmember Matthews. Yes, I'd like to comment on item 11, which is our reciprocal use agreement with Santa Cruz City Schools. And this is one of those hidden gems in the consent item, never flashy, but it represents literally decades of collaboration between the city schools and city of Santa Cruz on the collaborative and shared use of their facilities for the benefit of uh, young people and, and residents of all ages. There have been times in the past when there'd be a movement, well, let's sit down and figure how much an hour for this and how much an hour for that. And they said, you know, in the end, let's just have a, a common sense reciprocal agreement and it works really well. And I think that's when we get to health in all policies later on, this is health in all policies in action. That's my comment. <laughs> <laughs> nice comment. Okay, a comment at Councilmember Myers and then Councilmember Brown. Yeah, I just had a comment um, just on item number 12. I don't know if uh, Suzanne's still here, but certainly just wanted to congratulate the Public Works Department. Mm -hmm. um, just continuing to build out the green business program and uh, reach so many businesses and really just have such a quality program um, for so little money. <laughs> so just congratulations, Mark. Please extend um, that to Suzanne as well. Um, it's a wonderful program, so thanks for keeping it up. Councilmember Brown. So, uh, thank you, Councilmember Matthews, for, for calling that out. We heard a report at the City Schools Committee meeting about the work that's got, and got a little bit of the historical context, and it is really one of those hidden mm -hmm. gems, as you said. So thank you for 
that and the green business program, Council Member Myers. I assume that there, it looks like there are people in the audience who might want to speak to the um, local cannabis equity grant item seven. Um, and and um, so we won't pull it, but um, if you have any, if you want to come up and say something, I'm just. There will be, we'll, we'll give it, there'll be an opportunity, opportunity for, for that. Yeah. Um, but I want to say that I'm absolutely in support of moving forward on this and I'm glad that we're positioned to do so. Okay, I'll just echo those comments for item number seven. I think it really is a wonderful opportunity to bring equity into the industry and to support um, the businesses that are aspiring to either join the industry or currently um, administering great services to those in need. Um, so I'm happy that our staff was able to get this in place before I believe is a deadline of maybe April 1st uh, so that we can have our local uh, businesses be able to apply to the equity grant. So, okay, with that, I. I will go ahead and um, ask that if there are any members of the public who would like to either request an item be pulled or to speak to any item on our consent agenda, with the exception of item number eight and items number eight and 14, um, so now would be the time to do so. Please, to, to my left, and, oh, excuse me, just one sec. You'll have two minutes, and if you could come to the microphone, and we could go ahead and have you speak to any item other than eight or 14 on our consent. You will have an opportunity to speak to item number 14 after we go ahead and move the consent agenda. So there will be an opportunity for item number 14 public comment today. Yeah. Yes, no problem. So this is items uh, other than eight or 14 on our consent agenda. Okay, please. My name is Valerie Corral, and I just want to say thank you for moving so quickly. It's remarkable what you've accomplished, and I want to thank you too for all of the work and that it takes. It's just a, it's such a rare opportunity that we can find funding from the government and to be able to be funded by the state government for cannabis is phenomenal. We've come a long way in two and, well, it's taken two and a half decades, but we're here and in large part because of all of you and because of the work that you've done, I'm so grateful. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Hi, I'm Jim Coffus, and I, um, the deputy director of Green Trade. It's an alliance of local cannabis businesses, and I just wanted to thank uh, city manager and the council members for uh, the uh, quick action that you took to make sure that this. Uh, that we're able to make the deadline and you're able to make this application. And then just to encourage uh, the staff and uh, to go bold on their application, I think this is a uh, excellent opportunity to uh, get some of the money that has uh, flowed into the state coffers back into the local jurisdiction. And, uh, we look forward to helping in any way we can. So thank you very much. My name is Daniel Phillips, and I'm the CEO of Mother Humboldt. We are a local cannabis manufacturing and distribution company, and I'd like to thank the mayor and the members of the board and the city manager for taking on this. I'll be applying for one of those grants, and uh, we appreciate all your hard work. Thank you very much. Hi, uh, <clears throat> Pat Malo. I'm the executive director of Green Trade. I also have the pleasure of serving on the WAM board, and I just don't want to miss the opportunity to say thank you. So, John. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay. I, I, I'm sorry. This is for uh, any uh, public comment on items. Okay. This wouldn't be the time. Oral communications at 7 p.m. is the time to talk. To Okay, so we'll go ahead and uh, return to the council for action. Um, so for a motion on the consent agenda with the exception of eight and 14 and the modification as uh, articulated by city manager Bernal to uh, item number seven in regards to the 100,000 or more. Move I'll approval. Move. Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. I'll move the consent agenda with the notice or the uh, notice to include 100,000 or more for item number seven in both the resolution and the uh, and the motion. That's okay. included. That's included. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's a motion by Councilmember Myers. I believe I heard a second by Vice Mayor Cummings. Um, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? That passes with uh, Councilmember Brown, Councilmember Myers, Councilmember Matthews, Vice Mayor Cummings, and myself in support 
with Councilmember Glover and Councilmember Crone um, absent. Okay, so we'll go on to uh, the first item that was pulled, which is item number eight. And I will go ahead and ask Councilmember Brown to feel free to speak to this item. Great, thank you. So I um, pulled this not because I am not supportive of the application. I would just like to get a little bit more information uh, in terms of the amount to be requested, um, where the money will go. There was a reference to local partners who are going to be providing a match. Is that a one-to-one -one match? Just a little more information and the, yeah, the grant amount, at least target what you're looking at applying for. Good afternoon, Mayor and members of the council. Um, with me today is Allie Cameron, who actually is our economic development coordinator within the department. And she has been working on this grant, doing a great job pulling pulling information together. The grant awards are up to 750,000. Um, we are in the process, Allie, as I said, has been working on the grant and will be finalizing the actual grant application is due April 4th. We're in communication with our liaison, our representative from the economic development administration so we'll be refining that that grant application with her feedback to make sure that we're aligned the concept um, that we've been working on is partnering with um, Santa Cruz works and startup sandbox so that they would be providing any matching funds and there wouldn't be any cost to the city for for the grant application you'd like to ask for the questions uh, Councilman did Myers? you have other questions um, I just I, I wasn't I didn't know if the output of this would be an actual um, sort of a center. Uh, I, you know, I'm just curious about, uh, it says creation of centers for innovation and entrepreneurship. And I realize that centers nowadays can be virtual. So I was just curious, um, I know about the startup sandbox. So I just was kind of curious, is this a physical center or will it be sort of a, a network virtual center? The idea is that it's working in conjunction with the existing organizations so that we're leveraging and providing um, more support and infrastructure for those organizations to continue and expand. I mean, one of the things we really felt that there is a need for is particularly around the job training and um, the apprenticeship on entrepreneurship elements of it. And so this would really help sustain that and grow that element within Santa Cruz Works and Startup Sandbox. Thank you. Thank you so much for your work on this. We look forward to hopefully hearing more in the future. Are there any questions? It would be great if we could get a report back. I know this is probably, it'll be a way down the road before decisions are made, but it'd be great to get a report on what we're funded, if anything, and how. Oh, absolutely. Going. Thanks. Thank you. Here. Okay, we'll go ahead and see if there's any member of the public who'd like to address the council on item number eight of our consent agenda. Okay. Seeing none, we'll return to council for any type of action. Move approval. Okay, motion by council member Matthews. Second, second. okay, seconded by vice mayor Cummings. Um, any further discussion? This is for item 14. Item, this item, item number eight, eight. Yeah. yeah. No, no, no further discussion, okay. sorry. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes with the unanimous council present here and Councilmember Glover and Councilmember Crone absent. Okay, so we'll go ahead and move on to item number 14 and I will go ahead and ask Councilmember Brown to. This item came before us previously um, and uh, at, at which time uh, four members of the council, a majority of the council voted to deny the encroachment permit. Um, at this point, we've had uh, follow-up communication with uh, Verizon Wireless. We have, um, if the suit hasn't been, I, I don't know, maybe perhaps the city attorney can give an update about where things are at because I wanted just to set the context for a reconsideration here, why that's happening. Um, and I have some thoughts on other things we might do in light of uh, the position that we're currently in related to this issue. Certainly. Um, shortly after the council last considered this encroachment permit, I think on the February 26th uh, agenda, we received a letter from legal counsel for Verizon indicating that <clears throat> they intend to file legal action challenging uh, the council's decision not to issue an encroachment permit at that meeting. Um, under the rules that have been established for that sort of litigation, they have a very short timeline within which to do so. And I have been notified that um, 
the deadline to file actually expires tomorrow and that Verizon is preparing and intends to file a legal challenge um, <laughs> by tomorrow. Uh, as we also discussed at, at, at some length at the uh, February 26th meeting, um, we really have little in the way of a legal defense to that type of litigation because in essence, the council has already, or the city, I should say rather, has already approved the uh, land use application for locating a small cell uh, wireless facility uh, on Morrissey um, adjacent to the, the Safeway property. Um, and, and also <coughs> under the rules that the FCC has promulgated for, for processing those types of applications, what's known as the shot clock has already long since passed. So we've been working cooperatively with Verizon to um, finalize some details about the, uh, the wireless facility and to obtain an encroachment permit which is really um, in essence not a not permission given to Verizon to locate the the, uh, the facility there that's already been granted um, what the encroachment permit is essentially is a tool whereby we are able to require Verizon to maintain insurance um, covering the city in the event of an accident or other incident that gives rise to liability out there and um, uh, requiring Verizon to indemnify and defend the city if there is such an action. So so the encroachment permit is really more to protect the city than it is uh, a grant of uh, any sort of consent to Verizon. So that was the basis for the recommendation the last time and, and still remains the recommendation that the council approve the encroachment permit. Do you have further questions, Councilmember Brown? I have some comments, but I'll reserve those. It looks like there are members of the public who like after public comment. Okay, that sounds great. Unless there are any additional questions at this time, we'll go ahead and move to public comment. So now it would be the time to address the council on item number 14, and you'll have up to two minutes. Yes, my name is Drew Lewis, and since there's such a short time, I'll just read this article. Uh, in recent, uh, from Newsweek today, uh, parents concerned a fourth child diagnosed with cancer while attending California school with cell phone tower on campus. <laughs> parents in Ripon, California say a cell phone tower in a local schoolyard is to blame for the cancer diagnosis of four students in the last three years. The tower which is located at Western Elementary is the same as others scattered throughout the town. However, one parent told CBS Sacramento that his, that his proximity to her son led to his 2017 brain cancer diagnosis. Quote, we had a doctor tell us that it's 100% environmental, the kind of tumor that he has, unquote. Monica Farrell said in an interview, quote, it's, in, it's indescribable, it's really tough, unquote. Farrell's son, Mason, was the second child to be diagnosed with cancer in just three years at the school. Mason walked by the cell phone tower daily. She also told the Modesto B that when questioned, the school district cited an obsolete American Cancer Society study as a reasoning for keeping the tower in its current location in the middle of the schoolyard. Farrell told the newspaper that parents will continue to fight to keep their children out of the school. On Tuesday, more than 200 children were absent from Western Elementary as a form of protest. Tuesday night, the children's parents attended a meeting at the Ripon Unified School District. Richard Rex, whose family lived across the street from Western School City, bump appeared on his 11-year-old son's abdomen a month ago. His son now has, has liver cancer. The deployment of this technology will eventually put an end to all of those positive human elements we celebrated here at this meeting today. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Next speaker. Hi, thank you. I'm Gail Nakuna. And uh, I want to report some things about 5G and what other cities are doing. And I've looked into this quite a bit, so I have found a lot of information that might be a little different and shocking to you today. So, um, In Danville, California mayor admits local government has lost control on 5G rollout. This is from Robert Storer. Mayor Robert Storer stating that the vote was in an effort to stand up to the federal government and the telecommunications companies like Verizon. He says, we've made a lot of difficult decisions over the years and this one is right up there in my top three, but that is exactly why somebody elects us. 
to do the right things, Mayor Stormer Storer said during the council meeting. We've lost local control. And this says, you know what? We're sick of this and we're not going to just sit here and be bowled over. We say no, we play our cards out. We've been in lawsuits before. What we need to do is to make sure that we gain that local control. You cannot walk out of here and say we won by having the cell tower moved somewhere else. The point is to go out there and talk to your state legislators and make sure that they understand that we as the town of Danville deserve to tell people where we want to put these things, not to have them dictate to us. I find it amazing that we're told that we can only comment on the aesthetics as if we're looking at some inert object on a pole and nothing is coming out of it, that it doesn't do anything to people. Let me introduce you to um, a Nazi scientist, Hermann P. Schwann. He was brought to the United States in Operation Paperclip after the war. He is known for, may I have another minute, please? No, your time is up. We have, uh, uh, equi for Equitable Voice, we have a specific amount of time for each member of the public to comment to us, but you're welcome to leave uh, any item that you'd like us to review with our clerk here. Thank you. Okay, the next member is uh, welcome. You'll have up to two minutes as well. Good afternoon. Item number 14. <laughs> uh, my name is Barbara Riverwoman, and um, I actually expected there to be hundreds of people here today, and I think the fact that there isn't actually sh um, also represents a, a message to all of us, which is that the, so the letters that, there's so many letters um, to all of you, and um, so many citations of scientific studies, and I think the reason this chambers isn't packed is because first of all, you're being, you have basically a gag order or you're not being allowed to take a position. So people feel helpless to make a difference. And also because so many letters said that it's, I don't know this personally, I don't suffer from um, the, the effect of EMF, but there's a lot of magnetic radiation according to many people who testify in this chambers and therefore many of them can't come and they're asking for special considerations under the ADA Act um, because this act would so-called incommode them. It makes it impossible for them to be here. Um, so that's part of the concern um, because so many people I thought would be speaking on the health effects. I was going to speak on um, the effects to wildlife and I don't know anything about it really, but I did a little Googling. Um, I think I'm gonna spend more time studying this because the whole thing on so many levels concerns me. There's this man named Bill Sutherland from Cambridge University. Um, who points out that there are 100 billion devices that are expected to be wirelessly connected by 2025. Um, and um, he says there's an urgent need to strengthen the... Wow, it's going so and fast you, when you're the one that's and speaking. You're also welcome to leave any additional materials with our clerk for us to review if you'd like. Okay. Is there any additional member of the public who would like to address us on item number 14? Okay, seeing none, we'll return back to the council for action and deliberation. Okay. I'll go ahead. Yeah, I think uh, this repeats the, uh, basically the report that we were given previously and uh, given the uh, constraints upon us and the threat, uh, the very real threat of legal action, I am going to move that we um, adopt the resolution authorizing the uh, encroachment permit as described in the agenda item. We have a motion by Councilmember Matthews. Is there a second? I'll second that. Seconded by Councilmember Myers. Further discussion, Councilmember Brown. Uh, so I want to say a couple of things about this because I uh, have, was one of the council members who voted against issuing this encroachment permit at the time. My concerns continue to be the same. I'm to say that I am sickened by the dynamic that it we has been set up for us to make these kinds of decisions or inability to make a decision at the local level is is an understatement. Mm. Um, 
having had some conversations now and read uh, the, the letter from Verizon, um, you know, I just want to say a few things about it because it's really ugly what they're doing. Um, so we, uh, when the, the lawsuit, if it hasn't been filed already, will be filed before the deadline. Um, the letter, the contents of the letter made it clear that, um, th that the company has, um, you know, had representatives who have um, watched the tape of the proceedings. Um, the fact that um, there were speakers in the audience and other and members of the council who uh, made reference to health effects was part of the basis on which they have said they will sue us because we're not allowed to talk about that. As somebody in the audience mentioned this time around as well, we can only talk about aesthetics. I mean, this is a really troubling uh, situation and I doubt that Verizon's gonna watch the proceedings of this one, because I think we're going to end up um, supporting the encroachment permit uh, today. Um, and it is um, like just really, really disheartening to be in this position and to, to do this right now. So I, um, I would like to say that um, there, I think there's some things that maybe the council could consider and I want to put those out there, perhaps as friendly amendments. Um, given that we are always in this dance. Um, so the other thing that I uh, weighed in my reconsideration was the fact that this is gonna happen anyway. If we don't, um, if we don't uh, issue the permit, there will still be a tower there and um, we just won't, it just won't be permitted. It will be there and we will be dealing with this lawsuit and this comes up every time we get a cell tower, um, a, a permit of this type come our way. Um, we have very little control. I think I, I'm repeating myself when I say that, um, but I, I just, it, it's so frustrating. My other concern is that the, to the extent that we continue to oppose, that gives um, the telecom uh, additional uh, motivation to go back to the FCC and clarify these regulations to eliminate all forms of any potential local control that we do have left. And so what I'd like to do today is, um, if the maker of the motion would accept a friendly am amendment, direction to staff to return uh, to the council um, by the, um, with, what is it, May 12th, the first meeting in May? Um, council meeting in May with information regard, if or sooner, if possible, um, information regarding efforts by other cities to modify their local regulations to make it more difficult for these um, uh, uh, requests to be, for, make it more difficult for Verizon and other telecom, uh, I guess it's AT&T and Verizon are the name of the game, um, to uh, install cell towers within the city, um, within our jurisdiction. Um, I know I've heard from some of uh, the activists who have been here before us in the past and have written to us that there are other cities that are approaching this in different ways. So what um, other efforts are out there? What can the, what can the city do to try to protect ourselves for um, the future? Um, and two, um, uh, information about any efforts by local jurisdictions to mount a legal challenge to the FCC rules. I would like the city of Santa Cruz to either sue or join on in suing the FCC over these rules. Um, if there's an existing lawsuit we could sign on to, that's great too. So that is my uh, friend, hopefully friendly amendment. Um, if not, I'll make it as a separate motion. Um, but but I would like uh, some to direct staff to do that. I've communicated with the city attorney who seems to think that, that uh, some of that information is already being worked on by the um, city attorney's office and um, the extension to what's happening with legal challenges. Um, may perhaps, I, I don't want to speak for you, or Mr. Condotti. No, that, if, about that is correct. My of office has so. been monitoring um, both uh, more recent changes in the FCC regulations and state law and uh, efforts by other communities to try to uh, obtain some additional sorts of controls over the location of these types of facilities. And I just spoke with one, um, my associate, Stephanie Hall, who's been working on that issue for my office. And um, we think the timeline is is work definitely workable. Okay, that would be my question, but if that sounds workable, then that's great to hear. Yeah, to the extent it's workable, I'm fine. Okay, so you got that, Bonnie? I have it written down or I can reiterate it. I got it. Okay. 
Great. Great. So the, there was a friendly amendment uh, by Councilman Brown, the second, the accepted by the maker of the motion and the seconder of the motion. Any further discussion, Councilman? I just Brown? want to share the same, as someone who voted against this as well, I just want to share the same sentiments expressed by uh, Council Member Brown and just, you know, echo that we really need to bring authority back to local jurisdictions over um, where these cell phone towers are going to be located, their installation, better understanding how they impact health and the environment, and um, let's leave it at that. Yeah. Okay, Council Member Myers. I'll just echo. Similarly, um, I think, um, yeah, the local control is absolutely uh, necessary, and I think we should we should pursue that with other cities in California who are asking these same questions. So thank you. Okay, Planning Director. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council Members. I just wanted to call to your attention that based on uh, recent regulations, the city recent uh, FCC regulations and state uh, shot clock um, requirements. The city has been working on a ordinance change that would allow for us to meet those shot clocks. You know, we have several processes in place right now that really make it challenging to meet those criteria. And so on April 9th, we'll be coming to you with an ordinance amendment that has been through the Planning Commission that, um, that really um, takes a, a process out of the uh, the overall approval um, in an effort to meet the legal requirements. And so I just wanna be completely you know, uh, uh, transparent for you all and for the public so that everyone understands um, that um, we've got multiple things working here in uh, an attempt to meet the regulations that are placed on us while also attempting to respond to the desires of how we can uh, maintain more local control. Both and, right? Okay. Uh, uh, City Clerk. Can I just get clarification on the meeting date? You said May 12th? I put but that the, out there. May, may, you know, or is it the, the second the, meeting? The second yeah, Tuesday, is whatever. May, 20th, yeah. May 28th. The, the first meeting is May 14th. May 14th. I just put May 14th out there as <coughs> what I would think would be a reasonable. Uh, response time, but if sooner is if sooner can happen, sooner it's just fine too. Some flex. Okay. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. I about. wanted to put aid. If we're able it, to so put something together um, sooner, we'll, I'm happy to do that as well. Great. Okay, great. Any and, further discussion? Well, just I'll point out we did uh, unanimously, I believe, support um, uh, communication supporting Anna Eshoo's bill uh, on the same topic at the federal level. Mm -hmm. Any further discussion? Okay. So all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any aye. opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously with Councilmember Glover and Councilmember Crone absent. Okay. You, so Sorry. that <coughs> that concludes, <coughs> excuse me, the uh, consent agenda. And we'll now go ahead and move on to our public hearing. And uh, that's item number 15 uh, on our agenda packets. So this item is an appeal which will be conducted as follows. The staff will present their report. The appellant will have 15 minutes to speak and present evidence in support of their appeal. Opponents or the responding applicant will have 15 minutes to speak and present any evidence as well. We'll go ahead and open it up to public comment for two minutes. And then the appellant will have five minutes to rebut, but no new information may be presented at that time. After then, we will go ahead and return back to council for deliberation and action. Are there any questions about the process? No. Nope. With that, we'll go ahead and turn it over to our staff. Good afternoon, Mayor, Council Members. Happy birthday, Council Member Meyer. <laughs> uh, my name is uh, Mike Ferry. I'm in the planning department. This was my project. <clears throat> And I've got a slideshow that I'll, I'll bring up in just a couple minutes. So it's an irregular uh, shaped lot. It's on West Cliff Drive. It's considered a substandard lot because it doesn't meet the minimum lot, lot width for that zone district. So that puts um, additional restrictions other than the R15 zone district setbacks. Uh, there's substandard lot restrictions. And then on top of that, it's on the West Cliff Drive. Um, overlay area and that has even further restrictions. So it's basically the most restrictive zoned type of parcel that we see in the city. Um, it requires approval of a coastal permit, a design permit, and uh, it has to be consistent with the standards of the sub, of the um, 
substandard residential lots. And I put those in the staff report so that it would be kind of clearly delineated for you guys and how we respond to each of those, <coughs> what used to be findings and are now standards. So the uh, zoning administrator heard this on November 7th. There was five people that spoke in favor of the uh, project. And um, the appellant uh, is here today, Michael Brodsky, who lives just east of the project site, had some concerns. In response to those concerns, the zoning administrator asked that the windows facing east, the bedroom windows, um, create a higher sill so that they're more of a privacy type of a window. So that approval was appealed to the Planning Commission, and the Planning Commission heard that on January 17th. Um, Nobody spoke at that hearing except the appellant who still had the same concerns, a second story addition adjacent to his house. Um, <coughs> the uh, planning commission discussed it. They unanimously um, denied the appeal upholding the zoning administrator's approval. So that um, motion was appealed to the council and that's why we're here today. Um, the appellant submitted a revised appeal letter, and that should be in your packet. And again, he was uh, mostly concerned with the second story addition adjacent to his one story property that's located just to the east. So I'll show you the pictures. Maybe. Okay. So here we are, we're on Westcliff and Stockton. Uh, the appellant's one-story duplex is to the right here, or to the east. This is the lot to be developed. And we've got two-story houses um, across the street and then up to the north and up to the north here. And I've got some pictures of that. Uh, the zoning for the whole area is R15. And it's all in the appealable coastal zone, which means that the uh, project after the administrative process is through with the city can be appealed to the state. Uh, we did work with the um, State Coast Commission prior to the uh, zoning administrator hearing, and it's my understanding that they didn't have any um, issues with this development. They reviewed the plans and the site plan. So this is a picture of uh, Michael Brodsky's uh, duplex, the existing duplex. Um, the lot that's gonna be developed is on the opposite side of this house. And you can see just north of uh, Michael Brodsky's is a two-story. This is the lot to be developed. And this is Michael's house here. Across the street, um, well, let me back up. Across the street, you can see these two-story elements that are adjacent to the property. And there was some discussion in both the zoning administrator and the planning commission hearing about the heritage trees, and that's not an issue um, according to the recent appeal letter. But the, the whole heritage tree process, uh, after we got our arborist report and um, Leslie looked at the site, uh, to be conservative, this branch right here of one of those trees would have to be trimmed somewhere up around here to accommodate the proposed garage. So that's the only living um, branch it appears in this tangle of branches. So Leslie wanted to be conservative and include the heritage tree removal in case removing that did actually kill the tree. The rest of the trees are dead with the exception of this one, which is um, located off the property five or six feet and there are protection measures and the conditions of approval to root pruning and that sort of thing. To preserve that tree. So that's the house directly to the west across the street, pretty substantial uh, house. And just above, above that is a two-story, and that's a shot of the two-story that's just north of um, Michael's house. So this is a shot of the site plan. There's the 20-foot front yard setback line is this little dashed line here, and the Westcliff Drive um, pretty much uh, directs the only a certain percentage of the house can go up to the setback line and then you have to step the house down. And the applicant has done that. You can see um, barely on these plans, but this little dotted line is the out, outline of the second story and that's seven and a half feet away from the east property line. 
The first uh, floor is five feet, two inches from the east property line. And that again is the west cliff that makes you put the second story farther back than just our R15 zone district would. And it's the same over here. There's a 10 foot setback requirement for the second story along Stockton and an eight foot setback, which is a typical R15 setback. So they meet the setback criteria or exceed the uh, required setbacks. Floor plan's pretty basic. On the ground floor, you've got an entry, uh, kitchen area, dining, family room. There's one bedroom back here. Stairs up to the second floor, which lead to a second and a third bedroom, master bedroom. Um, they both open out into balconies that um, face the Monterey Bay. There's a couple uh, shots of the elevations. It's smooth uh, troweled stucco. It's uh, kind of a contemporary design. It should fit in fine with Westcliff standing uh, metal roof. The uh, architect put the 30 foot, foot height limitation to the peak of the roof. We measure it to the midpoint. So in the staff report, I think it's 26 feet and 10 inches in height, the way we measure it. So it's below the 30 foot limitation that is otherwise allowed. I'm going to skip that one. Um, this is the uh, side face, side of the uh, house facing Stockton. That's the back of the house, and this is the detached garage. <clears throat> and <clears throat> uh, the Westcliff Drive guidelines has a building envelope uh, that is created here. You go to the front property line, you measure six feet up, and then create a 30 degree angle. And because this is a, a um, a curve on the front. The architect took two measurements. So right at the edge of the property line, the closest property line to the east, that shows that this building is well within the envelope. And then further down towards Stockton, this shows the remainder of it is um, <coughs> in that envelope. And then this is a rendition of what the house is going to look like. So from this would be facing Westcliff Drive. This elevation is facing the uh, Pelinsong, Mike Song. This whole elevation is facing east. So that's um, the view with a six foot fence that the appellant would have. You can see the second story stepped back. These are the bedrooms that the zoning administrator asked that the window sill be raised to create more of a, a privacy. So that's it for the slides. Um, again, it's a, a contemporary design. Um, it'll fit in well with a lot of the other homes that you, we see along Westcliff. Again, the, the standards that uh, this house is designed under are the strictest that we have in the city, being a substandard lot in R15 and the Westcliff Drive overlay. Um, the appellant did make some recommended design revisions I think one of the planning commissioners asked uh, what it would take for him to be okay. He um, wanted an increase on the second story elevation set back to 10 feet from his property line. Um, currently at 7.5 feet. He also wanted a limitation of the square footage on the second floor. And with the substandard lots, there's two ways to um, design a home. You can design a home at 45% lot coverage. You can max out the lot coverage on the ground floor. Then you're limited to half of the floor area on the second floor. As an alternative, you can create a floor area that is 30% or less lot coverage, and that allows a full second story, even more. It doesn't restrict it to the uh, ground floor level. So they just chose to do it this way, and that's um, what our rules allow. So as design, it's fully conforming to the zone district requirements um, and staff is recommending that the city council deny the appeal, upholding the planning commission's acknowledgement of the environmental determination and approval of the coastal design heritage tree removal permits based on the findings that are listed in the staff report. Um, and it's in your attached resolution. Uh, I did receive five letters in favor of this, um, and I don't know if more came. I heard some might have come, but I didn't see those, and, and I've had no uh, comments in opposition to the uh, project. So that concludes the staff report, if you have any questions.
Thank you so much. Okay. Are there any questions of the staff at this time? If not, we'll go ahead and uh, move on to the next uh, uh, component of the hearing, which is uh, an opportunity for the appellant to have up to 15 minutes to speak and present any evidence in support of the appeal. Good afternoon, Mayor and members of the council. My name is Michael Brodsky. I live at 1712 Westcliff Drive. Thank you for the opportunity uh, to address you this afternoon. And I'd like to start as I did before the zoning administrator and the planning commission by uh, welcoming Mr. Kumar and his family to the neighborhood and stating unequivocally that I support his development of his lot. Uh, the lot's been vacant for some time. It's attracted littering and other nuisance activities and it will be very good to have a home built there. Um, I have also want to state I've never objected to him having a substantial second story on the home. I have some very specific concerns um, with areas that I do not believe are in compliance with the zoning code. Um, Mr. Ferry uh, mentioned that the, one of the zoning commissioners asked me, well, what do you want? Uh, he caught me flat-footed. I didn't have an answer. I didn't have specifics. So for this appeal to the city council, I did put down three specifics that I think are, are reasonably modest. And I would like to show you uh, the photographs that are attached to my appeal letter. I understand I can plug this in here. Good. I'm not, uh, not much on tech. You could go ahead and pause the time if, if you can. Uh, let's see, I think it's this bottom photo here. <coughs> Show that one first. Can we try one more time? The other one more. Okay. It's not possible to try it some other way. Oh, there. There you go. Okay. All right. Well, I I had the second photograph was was really the one that was more critical. Anyway, this uh, is the timer started again. Mm -hmm. uh, <coughs> Have it in our it's uh, the one actually, yes, I do think you have it in the letter. So it's yeah. this one here where I've drawn the red line showing the height of the new home mm -hmm. juxtaposed to my home. If you could look at that, that'd be great. Sorry, I said I wasn't much on tech. Uh, I also just want to mention that I'm very grateful to the city staff has been very helpful to me throughout this process and as, especially Mr. Mike Ferry has been uh, a very cordial and patient in helping me out and I appreciate that. So um, then to move on to the substance of it, uh, the zoning code section that I'm primarily basing my appeal on is uh, section 24.08.440 paragraph 3 which applies to substandard lots. And it reads, quote, new structures shall be consistent with the scale of structures on adjacent lots and generally be compatible with existing surrounding structures, end quote. So that sentence has two components. Um, the first is that new structures shall be consistent with the scale of structures on adjacent lots, which is a very specific requirement. New structures are consistent with the scale of structures on adjacent lots. And then the second part is that new structures shall be generally compatible with existing surrounding structures. And so on the second photograph that's not showing on the screen, uh, you can see there that my home there, which is approximately 1,300 square feet, in one story and nine foot to the eaves and 15 foot to the peak is the only structure on an adjacent lot. <coughs> the stone house falls under the other part of the zoning code, existing surrounding structures. The stone house is across the street from my house. It's, it's not on an adjacent, it's not an adjacent structure. So my home there is 1,361 square feet. 
Uh, Mr. Kumar's proposed project is 2,931 square feet, more than twice the size, and his second floor is 71% of the first floor area. Now, I understand that he's taking advantage of a bonus provision, whereas if his lot coverage is under a certain amount, then his second floor can exceed more than 50% of the first floor. I, I get that. But there's also this countervailing requirement here of being consistent with the scale of structures on adjacent lots. And I think 71% is pushing too much to be consistent with both of those requirements. So with, with those things in mind, what I've asked for that I think would bring it within compliance with the zoning code is to increase the second story setback on the east elevation. That would be the elevation of his home that runs entirely parallel to my home to a setback of 10 feet. It's currently at seven and a half feet. So that's an additional two and a half feet. That would do a, a, a few things. It would make a big difference to me in terms of how imposing it is. It would make a big difference in terms of light and it would make a big difference in terms of another zoning code section, which is 24.08430 paragraph five, which provides maintain a compatible race relationship to and preserve solar access of adjacent properties. So that two and a half feet on the second floor there, pushing that back just a little bit, would let a lot more light and solar access in for me, and I don't think it would make that much of a difference in the design. This, the second thing is, is that Mr. Kumar's garage, his one-story garage is taller than my home. It's at the, toward the back of the lot, pushed up against one of my back bedrooms, and it's only set back three and a half feet from the property line. And so again, under, under the rubric of the zoning zone, consistent with structures on, on adjacent lots, I've asked that that be pushed out further toward the street. I've, I've named the figure of 10 feet. Um, Mr. Ferry said it can be pushed, in a, uh, I named an, an additional 10 feet, making it 13 and a half feet. Mr. Ferry noted in his report that it could be moved five feet, making it a total of eight and a half feet setback and be consistent with all other requirements of the zoning code. I understand you want the garage set back a considerable distance from the street. It still would be a considerable distance from the street, but doesn't have to be like three and a half feet from the property line. And then the third thing I've asked for is to limit um, the second story square footage. I've, I've put down a figure of 55%. I just think if, you know, in looking at this photograph and this photograph in particular, you can see where those red lines are, how much bigger the proposed structure is than my home and that, that's the second story that's the most imposing. And I, it's just hard for me to see how uh, a 2,900 foot structure with uh, 70, over 70% 70 second floor coverage and the only adjacent structure is my tiny little one story home, how that can comply with zoning code requirement um, that says it should be consistent with adjacent structures. And I just, I just respectfully disagree that the stone house is an adjacent structure within the meaning of that zoning code provision. Um, there's no definition section that defines adjacent structure in your zoning code that I could find and where there's not a definition section, we just give words their ordinary meaning and we just don't understand the house across the street to be adjacent. We understand that it's my house that's adjacent. And uh, as far as the trees, uh, I mean, you know, that some of the trees are dead, they're all grown together, part of it's alive and green. Uh, you know, dead trees, snags are part of the ecosystem. You know, there are a lot of them at Lighthouse Field I was noticing. Um, you know, that's, that's not the biggest issue for me, but the way it sits right now, all those trees would have to be completely cut down the way they're intergnarled and stuff, and a lot of it is green. And I was hoping to work out something where they could be trimmed or some, something could be accommodated. Um, I, you know, they're, kind of, they're weird and they're old and they're gnarled and, you know, I kind of like them. So 
maybe maybe that's me. Maybe I'm maybe I'm just weird. I don't know. Okay, uh, may I answer any questions? Go ahead and pause the comments. I um, is I'm trying to recall if that is if this is the time for questions from council or if that's at the end. If there's any additional questions, I'm looking to you. Okay, are there? I'm happy to entertain any questions that may come up for council members. Not at this time. Okay, thank you. Okay, got it done in uh, nine minutes. Okay. <laughs> So at this time, we'll go ahead and invite up the opponents or the responding applicant, and you will have 15 minutes to speak and present any evidence before the council. Afternoon, city council member. <clears throat> My name is Jagdish Kumar. I'm at the property of Downer. So <clears throat> we designed this house with the city the way they want it. And with my engineer, we really work hard to put beautiful house over there. We work with the planning very hard. We talk a daily basis, Mr. Mike. He was so helpful, answer my phone call, also my engineer, and we come up with that design. Personally, I take that design door to door. Anybody have any common, people love it. They say, oh my God, this is beautiful. And some people say, oh, could you build us a house like that? <laughs> I, say, I can't do that. <laughs> I mean, it's, do you guys see the picture? The, that house, it bring all this neighborhood value up. I meet all the city court, every single thing required of the city. I go beyond that. And also, in the West Cliff, in front of my property doesn't have no sidewalk because my lot is a virgin, never have building there. And Mr. Michael property, front of him, there's no sidewalk. I talked to the public work, the West Cliff area, only one area does not have a sidewalk. So I tell the public work, I'm going to put uh, the sidewalk continuous all the way front of Michael property. Because that way, public can walk mm -hmm. safely both sides of the best cliff. Sometimes they get too many people crowded. People walk there shoulder to shoulder. <clears throat> that way, people can walk both ways. They have option. I'm spending my own money to prove that neighborhood. And as uh, far as I'm concerned, his complaint is unvalid. It's nothing there. Nothing there. It, my project already proved twice. And it's such a so beautiful design. I at least I go to at least 50, 60 houses to take door to door. <coughs> Nobody, even one person not say that design is bad. People love it, love it. I mean, love it. And uh, I really requesting, and please, this is beautiful design, don't destroy. Please, that's all I'm gonna say. Are there any questions for um, the responding applicant? No? Okay. So at this time, we'll go ahead and uh, return, no, we'll go ahead and ask if there's any member of the community who would like to address the council um, during public comment on this item. Okay. All right. You'll have, you'll have up to two minutes. Council Persons, i try to make it brief. <clears throat> I'm a 50 plus year resident of uh, the West Cliff neighborhood. Um, I live uh, two houses from a property. I sent you a letter or email. Uh, Dave Rowan's my name, I'm sorry. And um, I live two parcels from a property that Jack developed on Bethany Curve. It's absolutely <laughs> magnificent. He also did a project on Fair Avenue, two, two houses from Westcliff Drive. Again, another stellar project. And after that one, he did another property on, on uh, Bromer, uh, just toward 7th Avenue from El Dorado. <clears throat> Again, a, a, a fabulous development, uh, both a, a, a nice large home, single story, with an ADU. And uh, with the need for housing 
in the area, I think he's done more than his share of helping to that end. I've reviewed the plans. I've been on the property. This is a great project and it'd be nice to see it as an addition to Westcliff Drive, be an asset for that neighborhood. So, um, and again, as I looked at the staff report uh, and Mr. Kumar mentioned, he's met every requirement that staff has uh, put forward to him. And uh, as he has always done with the projects he's done in this area, this is going to be his home. I hate to see him leave my neighborhood and move over there, but that's probably what's gonna happen once that's finished. But we'll see, at any rate, a very nice project and I hope you uh, follow through and deny this appeal. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any additional members of the public? Okay. You'll have up to two minutes. Thank you, Mayor, Council members. I don't know either the appellant or the applicant and I wasn't going to speak, but um, listening to the appellant, I thought that his <coughs> concerns were very reasonable. And while it may be a beautiful structure, it's a very different ball game when it's right next to your house right. and you haven't had a two story next to you. And I think that sort of trumps everybody else's opinion, including my own, except to say I thought that uh, the uh, in scale with the adjacent property is something that should have guided this from the from the get-go, and it obviously isn't in the scale of the adjacent property. So I think that the appellant has some very good points, and I don't think he's crazy or whatever the words he used. The trees definitely are gnarled and a lot of dead bits, and uh, cypress are not like eucalyptus. Uh, little branches won't come out of a dead part if there's no green on it, but they have a, a beauty, they have a, a structure. You see the greenery from West Cliffs. So if there's any way to preserve those, um, I think that would be very reasonable. But I hope you'll really weigh carefully the, uh, the, imp the impact on the person who will have this next door, even if it were the Taj Mahal, you know, there, there is an impact there. Thank you. Are there any additional members of the community who would like to address the council? I'm just uh, wanting to talk about the trees. And I think that if they cut out the dead parts and leave the live parts, that would be the best possible solution for the trees themselves. Um, I don't see any need of clear cutting the area. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we'll go ahead and conclude public comment on this item, unless we have, a, feel free. You'll have up to two minutes to address the council. Good afternoon, uh, council members. So uh, I'm uh, Arun Shah, I'm the engineer, I'm uh, helping uh, Jagdish Kumar help uh, design the house. So uh, the way uh, the neighbor's house is set is way back uh, compared uh, in relation to uh, Jagdish's house. So yeah, it is a two story. Uh, we have all the code requirements, we have met uh, all the code requirements. And uh, so it is a two story house, I mean, we cannot deny that. Uh, with the uh, challenges of the curve of Westcliff uh, Drive and the way other properties are uh, around there, uh, it is, uh, that is how we can situate. And it's a small lot uh, compared to other, uh, the one across the street from uh, Jagdish's house. So what we have done, tried the best to fit and accommodate uh, uh, everything, all the considerations. And so, um, still, the adjacent house is even uh, much bigger across from uh, uh, Jagdish's house, maybe not uh, the 1721, but the next, uh, next doors is much more. This is a very elegant design and nothing audacious or nothing atrocious uh, uh, in our opinion. So it should fit very well uh, in the neighborhood. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Additional public comment? Okay. Hello, my name is Antonio, and I, as a, as a member of the public, noticed what appeared to be an ambiguity brought by the appellant, and that is, uh, uh, what is it, ad adjoining structures or ad adjacent structures? And 
In, in the rules of statutory construction and statutory interpretation, uh, judges are not allowed to, by implication, extend the statute beyond the clear words. And there is nothing that was presented that said immediately adjacent, which would fall in, in his interpretation, which would favor him. However, adjacent could also merely mean next to, such as the other homes that the individual to my left has shown. And that is literally adjacent, not that they're immediately adjacent, where again, the rules of statutory interpretation may apply. So with that being said, I think it would be very unfair for an individual that clearly appears has worked so hard to uh, purchase a lot that was for sale for over $2 million. And it just seems very uh, inappropriate to not allow it, the individual to pursue to pursue what a lot of us would like to, which is the American dream and the pursuit of happiness. And to deny him that pursuit based on an ambiguity of statutory uh, wording uh, would not be uh, just or fair. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Okay, if there's no additional public comment on this item, we'll go ahead and return to uh, the process. At this point, the appellant will be given an additional five minutes to rebut any um, insights, uh, but there was not, this is not an opportunity. No, please feel free to come forward. Uh, but th there will be no new information uh, to be presented at this time. You can just simply rebut any of the comments made by the- okay. uh, I just occurred to me, I told you I wasn't good on tech. All I had to do was click the button. And that brings up the second picture that I wanted to show you that I did show you, so it's not new information, but it just, again, gives you an idea of the scale. Um, the definition of adjacent is immediately next to. So across the street is not adjacent. Um, just to reiterate, I support Mr. Kumar developing the lot. I support him having a beautiful home there. I make no comments on the, on the quality of his design or, or criticize it in any way in terms of the aesthetics. Uh, I support him having a substantial second story. Um, I think that the things that I've asked for are reasonable in order of the least intrusive on him. Moving the garage 10 feet further toward the street, I, I don't really see how that's a problem for anybody. It creates a little backyard space in back of the garage for him and gives me a little relief. Increasing the second story setback from seven and a half feet to 10 feet on the side adjacent to my property would make the setback equal, second story setback equal to what he has on the street side. So I don't, I don't think that's asking much, but it would make a substantial difference in terms of meeting the intent of the zoning code. And the third thing of reducing the coverage of the second floor from 70 some percent downward, I think is a more substantial ask, but uh, not unreasonable. And actually increasing that setback on the eastern side by two and a half feet would actually uh, decrease the second story coverage somewhat. So I think I'll, uh, I'll wrap it up with that. Okay, thank you. So at this this is the time now where we'll have uh, council action and deliberation. So we turn it back to council. Can I sit down Can, you can go ahead and sit down. Thank you. Um, I did have one question uh, first, and that is um, regarding the trees. Um, as I read the report, the arborist report, tree number one is on the neighboring property, and that's the one that's healthy. Am I reading that correctly? Yes. And so in the construction for this property, there's some protection called for for the neighbor's tree, which is in decent shape. Yes. Okay, and all the rest of them are dead or recommended for removal. That, that's um, what I'm reading here. It's a little confusing. So a dead heritage tree, you don't have to get a heritage tree permit to remove that. So that can just be I'm removed. Just looking at the whole list here, dead, yeah. dead, 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 removal, removal. <laughs> that was the arborist suggestion was just to remove the dead ones. And, I, and those that were in poor and declining condition, I, yeah. Well, um, I am actually prepared to um, uphold the actions of the um, Planning Commission and um, deny the appeal um, uh, following the language, um, approval of the coastal permit, design permit, heritage tree removal permit uh, with the findings. And my reasons are that this does meet the um, 
uh, conditions of the um, zone. And although the line, uh, the upper limit line is shown across the uh, whole area. In fact, I think this design has a fair amount of, has hip roofs and gable roofs and a, a fair amount of articulation um, on the sides uh, with with the various roof lines. So it's it's got a good amount of variety into it. I think the, um, uh, property owner showed an exceptional effort at outreach uh, and received um, general community support for that. Um, there's certainly a public benefit with the extension of the sidewalk across that whole stretch there. Um, and um, for those reasons, I think it um, it's uh, it meets the requirements of the zone. It it will be an addition. Um, and there is some additional community benefit. So I will move that we uh, deny the appeal. We have a motion by Councilmember uh, Matthews. Is that a second or? No, I have a couple of questions. But okay. I had questions as well, but the motion's made, so I'll wait for the second. Okay, I'll go ahead and second that. And uh, Councilmember Brown. Um, so with respect, I actually, um, just to get some clarification here on the, um, and I want to commend every. All parties have, have been involved in this. It is a uh, beautiful design. There is public benefit, um, as Council Member Matthews suggested with the sidewalk. Um, and I also get the, the um, what what uh, one uh, commenter suggested is the Im you know the impact of the the directly adjacent neighbor and those concerns. So I'm just wanting to make sure I can be clear about the um, the appellant's uh, suggestion that and I'm this is related to section 24.08.440 paragraph five um, about maintaining compatible. Um, something maintaining compatibility and preserving solar access and the contention that uh, a, f a greater setback would actually provide that. Um, can you weigh in on this? Because that is, a, I think that's a significant concern if a 10 foot uh, setback versus a 7.5 setback, um, and I don't know how much that would reduce the overall square footage, but I just kind of like to get a better sense of what that means. If uh, we didn't request a solar study <clears throat> on this on uh, commercial properties we usually do. I had a similar application, a similar circumstance with a, a neighbor appealing where we did um, a solar study and we don't have a definition anywhere except the 1995 general plan. I think there's a definition in there on uh, preserving solar access and it was specifically for an existing solar uh, array on somebody's house. So the only restriction was that you couldn't do an addition that would affect someone's existing solar array. Typically when we look at a, a property like that and we look at the findings that we make, if they're meeting their setback and their height requirements, they're meeting the adjacent solar access finding. Okay. And then I guess okay. the other question that I had, which I'm not sure if it's appropriate to ask this question, but has there been any conversation between the applicant and the appellant regarding um, some of what might be considered minor modifications with respect to the garage and or the setback for solar access? Um, ha has there been any conversation about that or are we, it's not even at the table for our consideration today with what we've got, but I'm just wondering if that's happened at all. I don't know. Either the applicant or the appellant. I'm certainly willing to engage in that process. I mean, I did attempt to, the first thing I expressed to Mr. Kumar was about the garage. Uh, the first time I met him, uh, that didn't go anywhere. Um, okay. It takes two parties to communicate. I'm not pointing any fingers, but I'm willing to, to sit down and try to work it out. It hasn't happened yet. Would you like to respond as well? The garage is situated where it is because of the, uh, so that we can get parking on the property and not mm -hmm. uh, rely on uh, off street parking. And that is why if we move it forward, then we lose uh, parking on the property. And that's, uh, and West Cliff being on weekends and stuff, you know how uh, uh, crowded that area is. So we don't want to rely on off street parking and ha have everything on site. 
Yes. Uh, and the other uh, point that was brought up about the window, so uh, and raising the window sill, that's a bedroom window and building code requires 44 inch maximum sill height. So that can be an issue if we raise the sill height, we cannot meet building code requirements and then we cannot have a bedroom there. So. So that uh, that way kind of uh, limits our uh, ability to raise how high we can raise the window. So, so just if to, so I make sure I'm clear, is that so the window height is related to the setback? A bit this, because I, I, my understanding was that conversation was had and there was some movement on the window height, but I don't, I'm specifically talking about the setback itself. I'm sorry, no, no, it's yeah. not related to the setback. Okay. Yeah, setback, we, we, meet, we are meeting the uh, municipal code and a lot of effort goes into developing this code and all these requirements are looked into when, when the code is put together. And that is why we, I mean, we are complying with all the requirements on the setbacks and, and heights. The, the window sill question, um, that came from the zoning administrator. That was a condition that he added to the conditions of approval. So if it turns out to be a building code issue in a situation like that, we would ask for frosted glass or you know, cracked glass, some sort of a privacy glass. So that, that wasn't, my question was about the setback. I, I'm just thinking about the solar access. That, that's, a, uh, I, that's a serious concern. Yeah. Go ahead. Hi, Lee Butler, Planning Director, and I just want to clarify um, the condition as written would necessitate that the closet in that rear bedroom be moved from the rear wall because as written, I believe it has, a, does it say a five foot sill height? Uh, it's not specific, just not specific, just yeah, higher, higher, sill height. higher the sill height. Higher sill height. So, I mean, to address privacy, um, I would recommend one of two things if the council uh, continues, that would be um, put in privacy glass or um, the other way to meet ingress egress would be to move the closet to that easterly wall and provide the ingress egress window on that rear north elevation. That's what we articulated to the planning commission is what would be needed in order to um, accomplish uh, the objective. But it, it can also be frosted glass if it's just a, uh, if it's a privacy issue that uh, the council wants to address. Do you have additional questions? I was gonna see if I could get further clarification on the solar question that was raised earlier. <coughs> if I um, interpreted it, and my understanding was that by design, it essentially will allow for solar, but it hasn't been updated, or is that the wrong interpretation? Maybe I can get more clarity from ours. Well, that's what we look at. We, we look at the, the, the reason we have setbacks is to preserve light, air, and privacy. That's the basic zoning stuff. So if, if they're meeting the setbacks, then they're preserving light, air, and privacy. Okay, that's what I was trying to get to. Okay, thank you, I appreciate the clarification. Any further questions, Council? Well, not a question, just a comment. Okay, um, let's go, okay yeah. maybe Vice Mayor Cummings and then Council Member Matthews. Did you have a question? I did. Um, so with regards to standard, standards for substandard residential lot development, um, under um, number three in the staff report, at the, at the end of the paragraph where it says, where the point is new structures shall be consistent with the scale of structures on adjacent lots and generally be compatible with existing surrounding structures. And notice that, that the last sentence really focused on how there's, there are a number of two story homes in close proximity and the proposed residence is, is consistent in scale with those structures. And earlier it's mentioned that you know, there's a non-conforming single story duplex located to the east of the proposed home, however, and then it goes into the first floor, uh, different, different parts of that structure conforming and I'm just wanting to get a little bit more clarity on how it is that the entire structure that's adjacent is not taken into full consideration um, with when discussing the architecture of the, the, the house that's going to be neighboring it. So that finding number three says new structures shall be consistent with the scale of structures on adjacent lots and generally be compatible with existing surrounding structures. So so we look at that finding, um, we're not gonna limit um, a house to one story because there's an adjacent one story house. As a matter of fact, we took um, what used to be an old finding about avoiding 
two-story additions adjacent to one-story houses. That was removed by the city council in 2017, I think. All right, Councilman Matthews. Yeah, I just, um, I think you've answered it, but um, historically in my experience, adjacent means not just immediately next door, but in the general area. And and this, when we look at the number of two-story houses in that area, it's um, generally compatible with the existing um, pattern. And in terms of solar, um, when you look at the layout on the lot, um, true, just by meeting the uh, zoning code that with setbacks that accommodates um, uh, solar access, but this has a, um, a gabled roof with the, the slope down towards the adjacent cottage. So that's allowing the solar access more than a flat roof would be. And it's um, the adjacent cottage is facing south. It, it seems to me it's, it's always a surprise to have a house built on a vacant lot. That's a fact. And, um, but here I think um, there will still be a good deal of solar access and um, uh, because of the orientation and um, as I said before, this does meet the requirements of the zoning code and I think will uh, in time fit in well. Okay. Councilmember Myers. Um, I thought I mentioned, you mentioned during the staff report that did you consult with coastal staff on this or? Uh, you... When we have something that's appealable to the coastal commission, they usually ask ahead of time to see a copy of the staff report. So we sent them the staff report and the conditions and the arborist report prior to the zoning administrator hearing and the response back was, you know, we don't have an issue with this. Thank you. I'd like to point one thing out. Lee asked me to uh, let you know that the second story eave is 22 feet in height, 22 feet and three inches. So that's the one that's set back from the uh, east property line. The 30 foot height that we see in the picture is to the peak of the roof. And we average the highest plate line, which is that eave and the peak of the roof and come up with whatever I said in the staff report, I forget, 26 feet, 10 inches. All right, thank you. All right, if there's no further discussion, we have a motion by Councilmember Matthews, seconded by myself. Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? No, I'll, I um, will support the motion, but I do want to just comment that I'm. I just. I really wish there was a way that we, there was, could get some movement um, from the parties to um, try to resolve this issue related to solar access because I don't. I'm not willing to hold this up for a, a solar study, but I, I do think that it would be a real shame to lose that that solar access if that's in fact the case, and we don't know because that wasn't looked at. So. This question that um, Mayor Watkins raised doesn't have a definitive answer, and it, it sure would be nice to um, be able to make our decision with, with that in mind. So um, I'll just say that. Okay. So we'll go ahead and log a yay vote in support of the motion, correct? Just for clarification on your position. Okay. I, I mean, they meet the rules, they meet the rules. Yeah. Yeah. But you're supporting the motion. I mean, I think for the record, okay. I also make a comment for the record. I just want to say that um, I do think that you know it's it's unfortunately that it's unfortunate that the language in here is kind of vague about what constitutes an adjacent structure because when um, I, and I appreciate that you know we're building new homes in our neighborhoods but when newly built homes um, are not being you know if it's a, if we're talking about adjacent structures and that structure is not the house that's directly next to it um, and I know it says generally compatible but I feel like um, I just want to you know, put it out there that um, if this were a house coming in next to me, I would, my expectation would be that the adjacent structure would be compared to the house that's currently there, not the ones that have been recently built in the area. So um, while I support this, I do see how um, the interpretation of this language is it's kind of difficult being someone who's had a house in the neighborhood for a long time. Uh, any further discussion? Okay, all those in favor, so we had aye, that's unanimous with Councilmember uh, Crone and Councilmember Glover absent. I was just gonna say I'd like to commend the member of the public for the well thought out legal argument. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Stated from our, le our, our legal uh, staff here. All right, thank you for that, Tony. All right, so at this point, we'll go ahead and maybe take a short window of time, maybe about a five minute break as we transition to item number 16. Can you just pull this out or do I need
Okay, we'll go ahead and resume the meeting. Um, we are now uh, on item number 16, excuse me, which is um, our uh, public hearing for Highway 1 and 9 intersection improvements. And we have our presenter, Chris Schneider, here. Mayor, Council Members, Chris Schneider, Assistant Director of Public Works, City Engineer. The item before you is the Highway 19 intersection improvements resolution of necessity in connection with real property acquisition. The recommendation is that the city following a hearing providing the owner of property an opportunity to speak, adopt resolutions finding that public necessity requires the acquisition by eminent domain of the real property owned by R&R Santee LLC located at 744 River Street and the real property owned by Richard L. Santee and Tawny Santee, trustees under trust dated September 7th, and Raymond Santee located at 808 River Street, and authorizing the city manager to proceed with eminent domain proceedings to acquire the real property. <coughs> um, the Highway 19 project has been um, under development for a number of years. In uh, 2004, the city engaged um, uh, BKF engineers to complete the environmental review and the design of this project. Um, it actually uh, precedes that date by a number of years. The first time I recall the project coming up uh, was when I started here in 1987, which was the Harvey West traffic study. And the plan was to develop this intersection to provide additional uh, travel lanes. Uh, since that time, there have been some efforts by Caltrans to develop a uh, interchange at this location, but really the interchange was very expensive, was not supported by the community, and um, really didn't serve the city, uh, and particularly the Harvey West and the downtown area. It provided a lot of throughput for Highway 1, but didn't do much for Highway 9 or River Street. Since that time, the city's taken on the effort to improve the intersection and has been using redevelopment agency funds as well as traffic impact fee funds to uh, prepare the work for the intersection. The project includes um, adding a second northbound lane on Highway 9 and the map on the screen essentially shows the green area, the city is a cry, uh, the city, the green hashed area are the areas that we're providing or uh, acquiring right away. In particular, uh, the Highway 9 section is the uh, properties owned by the Santees. The, the red or orange hashed area is the temporary construction easements and those to construct the project and then those, the remainder of those properties return back to the property owner. Um, the northbound lane um, on uh, the additional northbound lane on Highway 9 as well as the shoulder which fun functions as a bike lane provides for additional opportunities to the city to, um, uh, for the project to uh, reduce congestion and improve safety. It allows for an additional left turn lane on Highway 1 northbound towards the Harvey West area, provides for an additional southbound lane on Highway 9 towards the downtown, and provides a northbound lane on River Street towards the Harvey West area. And as we all know, that's one of the areas that is the most congested as far as getting out of the downtown area in River Street. Project also includes improving uh, bike lanes that are existing on River Street and adding bike lanes and shoulders to uh, Highway 9, which currently doesn't have any bike lanes or shoulders. The um, sidewalks are improved, new access ramps are installed, and um, the crossing of Highway 1 um, on the, uh, I would say the west side of the intersection is also shortened uh, slightly by the uh, improvements. There are no improvements proposed on the section on Highway 1 coming from the direction of Watsonville. That stays as it is. There's no changes to the Highway 1 bridge with this project. Um, on the acquisitions, the city has um, uh, hired an appraiser and completed the uh, appraisals of both the Santee properties, one which is a house at 744 River and the business at 808 uh, River Street. The appraisals and an offer were made on those appraisals in uh, July of 2018. Um, since then, uh, there's been no counteroffer from the Santees. 
Um, at one point, they had noted that they were having an appraisal, their own appraisal, none of the properties, but we have not received that to date. The reason that we are uh, moving towards the um, um, uh, resolutions of necessity for condemnation is because we have a, a $2.8 million grant to construct the intersection. And that grant is subject to some, uh, some deadlines. And essentially the deadline is that uh, we must get right away certification in July of this summer and award the construction contract by June of 2020, or we um, will potentially and very likely lose the $2.8 million grant. The um, project design does um, include the removal of some heritage trees. Uh, there are two redwood trees on the River Street side, uh, one that's in very poor health and is dying next to um, the summer solstice building and um, one heritage or one redwood tree south of that at the Gateway Plaza property. Two heritage trees are being protected. In front of the uh, Santee uh, residential property, there are a number of trees on the Highway 9 segment, uh, which will be removed with the project. Um, there is at least one heritage oak tree in that location. Um, the eucalyptus trees that line Highway 1 and the drainage ditch um, are not currently proposed for removal and are, and are not intended to be removed. In order to, um, excuse me, in order to, uh, to consider resolution of necessity, there's a number of tests for the project. The public interest and necessity require the property interest described in the resolution, which uh, they are and the attachments are included by, um, in the staff report. This uh, intersection is a ma major gateway into Santa Cruz, controls access to the university, downtown and the Harvey West industrial area. There are 100,000 motorists, buses and trucks that pass through this intersection daily. The new lanes and lane transitions and lane widths will improve traffic flow and reduce the number of collisions at the intersection. Improvements are also made for bikes and pedestrians. And modern traffic signal equipment's installed, which uh, provides for emergency vehicle access as well. <coughs> um, the second test, the project is planned or located in the manner that will most be compatible with the greatest public good and the least private injury. The project's predicated on adding the second northbound lane on Highway 9, which widens towards the Santee properties. It's the most efficient and economical manner to improve the intersection short of the full interchange that I've mentioned before. Widening on the other side of Highway 9 is not viable as it does not meet engineering standards for lane transitions and would adversely impact higher value properties and a greater number of tenants and public services. It's important to note that this is a Caltrans intersection and we are designing this to the Caltrans standards. And so the lane widths, shoulder widths, transitions, how the different lanes align are based on the Caltrans requirements. We actually tried to get some, um, some relief from those requirements a number of years ago. Essentially spent about a year trying to do that. We made a little bit of headway, but not enough, therefore, we are widening more on the Highway 9 uh, towards the Santee properties, more than we had originally intended. Number three, the property is sought, sought is necessary for the project. Um, the project requires roadway widening, which cannot occur without the property that we're acquiring. The offer to the owner or owners of record required by government code section 7267.2 have been made to the owner of record. On July 24th, 2018, you, Universal Field Services on behalf of the city provided the property owners of each of the parcels a written offer of the full market value of each of the two parcels. Uh, the offer was accompanied by the appraisal, an informational bro brochure, and loss of goodwill information. Um, if the city adopts the resolution of necessity, it would be able to file an action for condemnation, which is the next step in acquiring the property. Um, <coughs> The cost to acquire the two properties is expected to be a minimum of 1.73 million and relocation costs are anticipated to be approximately 800,000. 
of which 300,000 is for the relocation of the resident residents in the home at 744. We've relocated three of the six uh, residents currently and are working towards relocating the other three. <coughs> in addition, there will be legal expenses related to the condemnation action and uh, maybe additional costs arise due to loss of business goodwill. Funding is generated primarily by traffic impact fees at this point and um, is what is used for the acquisition of the property. The, con the grant that we are um, receiving, the 2.8 million, that will be, that is solely dedicated to construction. Um, it is not enough to construct the project. We'll also be uh, contributing more uh, traffic impact fees towards that intersection. There's no impact to the general fund. Um, that concludes my report. Thank you. Any questions at this time? Okay. Any um, member of the public who would like to address the council? This is item number 16. Okay. You'll have up to two minutes. <laughs> Good afternoon, council members. I'm Rick Longinati from the Campaign for Sustainable Transportation. Um, as you can see on this slide, the Highway 1 and Highway 9 intersection is uh, formidable if you're on foot or if you're riding a bicycle. Uh, I don't know of any scarier, more intimidating intersection in our community for a bicyclist. Uh, River Street's five lanes at the intersection, Highway 1 is eight lanes on the east side of the intersection. Uh, Jeff Speck, who wrote the book, uh, Walkable Cities, he puts it, uh, the more driving lanes a street has, the more dangerous it is. I think that's a pretty accurate rule of thumb. Uh, so this project would construct more lanes. Uh, what does this project do for bicyclists? Well, we've heard that it will add bike lanes on, on River Street, but those bike lanes will be four feet wide. Um, that's a minimum Caltrans requirement. They aren't protected bike lanes, and you can imagine someone swinging in from Highway 17, around, sweeping around that corner at high speed. I wouldn't recommend anybody's child being in that four-foot bike lane on River Street. The benefit of this project is not at all clear to me. How much time is this gonna save any motorist who's stopped at a traffic light? I think that's a question that we need to answer because there are certainly trade-offs with this project. Uh, the project would spend the lion's share of the traffic impact fee, including money that the university put in, 1.4 million that the university put in 10 years ago to fix some intersections around the university, we, we have a bike lane on coming down Bay Street that, that disappears before you get to Mission Street and the other direction past Bayview School, it disappears. These are just simple projects that haven't been done. So this is a case of, it's, it's a lost, lost Thank opportunity. Thank you. Next speaker. Mayor, council members, I appreciate a lot of work has gone into this. Um, I I'm, would be sad to see central home supply disappear, sort of place I have been to and fixture. I don't know what the owners feel about that. Um, but apart from that, um, the word improvements, I think I always uh, question that that's the appropriate word to use when what we are doing is enlarging uh, lanes of traffic, although I can see some advantages here. However, it mostly means that traffic will be going faster on River Street. I was a bit confused into hearing that, yes, this is one of the most highly used um, intersections in Santa Cruz with thousands of motorists, but there's no added lanes coming from Watsonville. I heard that as well. So this seems to be mainly for Highway 9 and I guess a bit of River Street. So um, that was a bit confusing. I was very pleased to hear that the trees, I was mistaken. I thought there, it was going to be widened coming from Watsonville and that all those trees, the eucalyptus at the intersection there would go. I'm very pleased to hear they won't go, be going. Maybe it was the in the 
bigger project. Just like to sort of put a bit of a bee in your bonnet uh, that I think we should be thinking in future. There are, there was an oak and a redwood tree. I know that redwood tree, don't know the oak. I think we should be thinking when we're talking in the millions as we are here, that trees, mature trees should be relocated, not just cut down. There are outfits that will relocate big mature trees. You can look that up. It's expensive, but in the scheme of this amount of money, it's not that much to relocate. So I'd ask you as you consider this going forward that that be in your thinking um, and part of any motion. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any additional members? Okay. You'll have up to two minutes. Good afternoon, Scott Graham. Um, I'm not understanding, this is two state highways and somehow the city is spending city money on this and is doing all this designing and is, I, I thought the state has the ability to uh, eminent domain property within the state of California. So why is it the onus put on the city to do this for state highways? Um, is it that the state has refused to do anything about this intersection, so we're taking it on because the state won't do anything? Or is it just that we're taking it on just to take it on? I don't, I, you know, it's not really clear to me why we're involved in a state highway project. Thank you. I believe that's our last speaker, so we'll go ahead and return to Council for Action and Deliberation. Can I provide just a little information in response to the speakers? Sure. So the university did pay 1.5 million in traffic impact fees for the long range development plan settlement. Um, that is for all, in, in, their impacts to all intersections in the city of Santa Cruz, including this one, and they have a huge contribution to the impacts of this intersection. Some time ago, we realized we were doing this intersection and that's why we went after a grant for the bike pedestrian underpass of Highway One, the Highway One Bridge. And that was con constructed a number of years. So that is really the safest access point to getting into the Harvey West area. You can get all the way up to the Ensignal tra uh, traffic signal to cross into the Harvey West area. Um, the grant and the traffic impact fee money that paid for that improvement was I think about a million dollars. The widening of the lanes that are come on Highway 1 coming from the Watsonville area, there are enough lanes there. There's not enough lanes on the bridge. So essentially feeding the, the lanes is the hardest, is the most difficult part right now with the narrow four lane bridge. Um, why is the city doing this and not the state? The state is interested in, in um, working with the Regional Transportation Commission to improve from Highway 17 in the other direction towards Watsonville, and they've been working on those projects. This one was lagging, and so the city, a number of years ago, decided to take it on, and that's why the city is sponsoring this project. It happens in a lot of communities that way, uh, where the city, uh, a city or a county may take on a state highway project. <coughs> Thank you for the clarification. Okay, any additional? Okay. I believe um, one of the property owners may w wish to address the council. Oh, okay. So you'll have up to two uh, minutes. I'll do it two minutes. Two minutes. Oh, I'm sorry. I misunderstood. I thought this was like the, the previous. Uh, is this, a, forgive me. Uh, this is an opportunity for um, the property owner to address the council on the findings that were made in the, in the proposed resolution of necessity. And if, and if uh, there's a disagreement with the findings um, to, to give the property owner a a chance to voice those concerns and and uh, outside and of the scope of the public comment. Right, outside okay, of the scope please, of the public comment. Mm -hmm. I thought I was going to get in ahead of that, but I'll get you guys to dinner soon. I promise. <laughs> I'm Rusty Santee, also known as Raymond Santee from Central Home Supply. Thanks for the opportunity to speak. Um, for 45 years, 45 years, we've been building our flagship economic center on River Street. I believe that qualifies us as a heritage business. Um, I would also like to think that uh, in that time we've served five counties, cultivating 
community goodwill through sales, service, and charitable works. We're staunch supporters of city schools, local schools, with the Life Labs donations, uh, community garden projects, the Habitat for Humanity, we're very active with them, and uh, Boys and Girls Clubs, just to name a few. We've grown to a viable, robust business in Santa Cruz with 15 employees, hundreds of contractor customers, and thousands of happy do-it-yourselfers. I recognize some of you here. <laughs> As we have grown, so has our town and with the traffic. University expansion coupled with the Harvey West Industrial Park invasion by retail giant Costco and other traffic boosting businesses have jammed the River Street Highway 9 intersection morning, noon, and evening. For over 10 years, we have advocated sensible solutions to these traffic jams at 1 and 9. Principal among these is another ingress egress to Highway 1 from Harvey West. We were approached by city traffic and Caltrans representatives years ago to help solve traffic congestion, and we have cooperated eagerly. Attending meetings and giving expert input, we live there, we see it every day, we know what the problems are. However, our input was politely and virtually ignored, and we're frustrated. The eventual plan before you has a minimal take, but most of the valuable portion of our business, our sales, showroom and offices, all our parking and bunkers, uh, are going away with this. If you look at the, the uh, diagram, I'm, I'm sure you all have that in front of you, uh, the very faint outline on the uh, end of the warehouse is our showroom and that's going to be leveled. The wall of the showroom that is, short, is shared with the, uh, um, with the warehouse is going, to be re is going to be taken off. The entire, oops, the entire house next door is also being removed. Did everyone get an opportunity to read the letter I sent? Did you all? Thank you. Thank you for your attention. Um, and so uh, the costs are gonna be horrendous to try and get all that done just cost-wise for us to try and stay on that site. To bring it home, it's the same as uh, someone needing a minimal portion of your house for the public good. Imagine they take your kitchen, bathroom, and a wall off your bedroom. Okay, are you gonna live there now? That's kind of what we're left with. So. Uh, we've tried everything, thinking inside and, out of the, and outside the box, but we can't realign and reconfigure our operations successfully after the take and with the road constraints uh, imposed by this project. Again, on the project down the middle of uh, River Street on our side uh, of Highway 1, you'll see a, a bright blue line, which represents a two-foot high wall that re reduces our business ingress and egress by 50%. And, uh, it's just untenable. There's no place for us to put a gate and have to deal with that and get around the traffic. Like we said, it's gonna be coming off of 17 and, and the speed will be increased. So having a retail operation on that, that uh, property with uh, the constraints is just gonna be very, very difficult. Central Home Supply is a very successful enterprise that we don't wanna lose. I want uh, to make it very clear, our, our community customers and uh, employees depend on us. We can't let them down. It doesn't make sense to spend hundreds of thousands at a site that won't work. By the way, the offer that we received in July from uh, Universal uh, was addressed from the city of Sunnyvale and the value that they gave for the house on, or for the, the commercial property on River Street was $2,300. We knew that that was an error we gave them uh, the, all this time to correct it and even pointed it out and just have received in the last few days a revised uh, offer. And we are behind in getting our valuation done, but uh, we're trying to figure out a way to make this work and it's just not feasible. But we'd have to regrade the property to uh, relocate the office. The office would be in a, in a bad spot. It's just, it's something that's tough to do and, and I think should be re-evaluated re or help us get relocated. We, we will relocate if we can find a place that's as good as this great spot we have. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I think I saw <coughs> Councilmember Matthews and then Councilmember Brown. And, and I can stay and answer any questions if yeah. you like. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I am one of those customers. Thank you. <laughs> um, 
And um, I am actually interested in the longer term in helping for the relocation, but uh, I, I do favor um, moving forward with this action. Um, this is certainly the most dreaded intersection in Santa Cruz, and um, it's true over the years there have been some uh, high use um, uses added in Harvey West in addition to those that um, have been there for, for longer, and I think we all know that. Not just Costco, but all the Harvey West um, playing fields, Kirby School, Plantronics, Tannery, Metro, um, City Construction, Corp Yard, et cetera, et cetera. So there, and not to mention all the um, traffic coming up from um, South County into um, the University and Santa Cruz for employment. So. Um, uh, to my mind, there's definitely a need. There will be some um, additional um, benefits from this. Uh, most importantly, I think, is the improvement of uh, emergency access and the fact that we have a deadline or we're going to lose money. I mean, figure we've been working on this for 15 years and it's only gotten worse. So I think uh, this is the time to um, give direction to uh, follow up uh, with the resolution at hand, um, finding the public necessity for acquisition. I hope that we can um, continue a negotiation that uh, works for all parties, but I think we need to go ahead uh, with this action. Um, so with that, I'm going to move the recommendation before us. A motion by Councilmember Matthews. A second? I'll second it. Uh, I do have a request um, a maker of the motion about asking staff to return to us. I, this is an ongoing process and we're going to be continuing mm -hmm. reports yeah. about this property and the adjacent, potentially the adjacent property um, over time. A request that staff report back to us on the feasibility of tree relocation for those two trees. I know that's come up in previous um, uh, discussions that we've had at the council around tree removal permits, heritage tree removal permits and certain kinds of trees are more amenable. I know it's costly regardless, but sometimes it's not even possible, but it would be, um, I would like to see um, a report back on the feasibility of doing that and the potential cost when we get our next update from, from staff. I would not want that to be a cost associated with the project, but I would be quite willing to say that we, um, if possible, offer the tree for relocation. I mean, so, yeah, at, so I just want to, I, I just want to know if it's possible. If it's possible. Yeah, I, I just want to know if it's possible and, you know, what, you know, what works, might, what we can. And it doesn't we can... hold everything up, of course. Okay. So it sounds like that. Not it, mandatory. It, it, okay. Yeah, just but, but I'd like to know what the possibilities are and what it would cost us. It's not going to cost us. Or what it would cost. I'm, it, it's it, irrelevant. It I cost. think the idea is, and we've done this sometimes with houses um, that are being, slated for removal from a lot that it sure. be offered relocation. Sure. That's my interest. I understand that. I'm just, I, th I would like to know what the cost would be. I, I mean, I, if we could get that, I'm not saying that I'm making a commitment to, to just explore it as a potential. Yeah, I just, I'd like to know what, it, what the cost would be. I understand where you're coming from, Council Member Matthews, but I don't think it would be a whole lot of effort to get a cost estimate. That doesn't make give us. That, that's no commitment on our part to purchase it or to cover the cost. But I just would like to know. I'm not really. I I see, I see that as an irrelevant request. I'm quite happy to say that we include with the motion that um, the um, uh, mature trees be offered for relocation at an in, at a third party's expense. Draw my second, and I'd like to make a substitute motion. Well, let's get where we're going because I want five votes for this. <laughs> so are you accepting the, the... Sure, if it only it takes us to get an estimate, fine. Thank okay. You. So there's a second with a friendly I'll amendment. With no commitment. Yep. Okay. I'm getting a cost, yeah. Uh -huh. Okay, so we have um, motion by Matthews, seconded by Brown with the addition to explore as originally directed the estimate cost or potential for tree relocation. Question by, if I'm. I just want to make one more comment as well before we vote, but um, if you've got a. Councilman <coughs> Myers, I think had a question. I, I just have one quick question um, about the appraisal. So was, did the appraisal include any 
re relocation costs for the business? Did it do any estimation on that at all? I mean, if there was if there was improvements that would be needed to maintain the property as a functional business, I don't remember seeing anything in there. But I just was curious. Uh, the business appraisal for 808 River included the land, the improvements, and severance, and so it did include funding for a new building. Is the way I understood the appraisal. Okay, thank you. Replacement. Okay, thank you. Okay. Councilmember Brown. Yeah, um, I yeah I just want to make a, a comment about the the widening and the safety issues ar um, around that intersection. I'm very sensitive to this, and I'm not a big fan of um, widening of highways in general. Um, so this in this particular instance, however, I am in favor of uh, a configuration that actually increases sa safety. And I, I know it's been, some folks have suggested that that may not be the case, but my understanding and everything I've looked at with respect to this particular intersection, I'd love to see a protected bike lane there. I don't know if that's something that's feasible. I'd, I'd love to hear from staff, you know, as, as this project proceeds, what the possibilities are for that. Um, and, but I, I think a bike lane there is, I'm, is absolutely better than what we've got now. And so I understand the concerns expressed. I, I um, in this case, I do think that um, that, uh, that intersection is gonna be safer as a result of the work that we're doing here. So I just wanna put that out there that I have not um, discounted those concerns in making this decision. Thank you. Okay, so we have a motion by Councilmember Matthews with an amendment and second by Councilmember Brown. Let's have a quick question. Okay. Um, so I just wanted to ask what is, around, you know, kind of building off what Councilmember Brown just said, what are some of the um, strategies to evaluating traffic improvements and safety improvements um, around this project? Um, well, the project was, uh, as I said, designed under the Caltrans standards and they, they do a lot of research and work on uh, transportation improvements, particularly, you know, that's why the, lane, the lanes are a certain width, that's why they're aligned a certain way to improve safety and to make it more obvious to the motorists where they're supposed to be. Um, what we've added that's not on this picture are the, are the bike lanes. Mm -hmm. I don't believe there's gonna be room for protected bike lanes, but we are adding green lanes um, at uh, both on Highway 9 and on River Street. Bikes are not allowed on Highway 1. I guess what I kind of meant was to follow up on that is what um, strategies or what what are going to be the, the strategies after the project is going to be completed to evaluate safety. So is there going to be any data collection after the project is done to yeah. look at traffic performance and safety standards and how that's impact how that's been impacted by the new construction? Right. We we do um, do collision. Uh, we do collect collision data that's provided by the highway patrol and the police department. Um, and we look at that annually, and we often do an annual traffic report that talks about the highest <coughs> collision rate intersections, et cetera. So that does occur. We also, um, Caltrans does annual counts of the city streets and the state highways, so we have that information. And I'll, I'll just quickly um, repeat what Chris said. That was a huge impetus behind that uh, river levee bike and, and pedestrian path going underneath. And we've heard recently how important that route is to people who are in the Harvey West area for bike and pedestrian use. Same. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, so at this point, uh, we'll go ahead and take the vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? That passes unanimously with Councilmember Glover and Councilmember Crone absent. Okay. Do we have... Uh, We have, Mar is Marcus here for item number 17? Am I not up yet? <coughs> it's living wage. Sorry. No, we're on I don't way. see Marcus here. It'll be quick, I bet. <laughs> City Manager Bernal. I was probably thinking it was uh, after this other item. Um, switch them. Yeah, like but I can just do yeah, we can do it. We can switch it. We can switch it if you okay, like. Okay, we'll go uh, ahead and uh, switch, uh, skip item 17, sorry. Yeah. We're calling you right back up. And then we'll have item 18 after when um, our finance director uh, becomes available. 
And if not, I can do it. Sure. Okay. Sounds good. So we're now on item number 18, which is the, um, we'll go ahead and wait till. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and ask that uh, you please uh, keep your voices down in the audience. Thank you, okay. We're gonna go ahead and have item number 18 and we'll return to item number 17 after uh, we conclude this uh, item. So um, this is the health and all policies work plan. Okay, we're good? Okay. Are we good to go? So um, I'll just briefly kick it off um, with uh, sincere appreciation and gratitude and excitement um, to get to this place for uh, the council members who serve on the subcommittee with me to um, move this forward along with our uh, <laughs> incredible staff who have put a lot of thought into coming up with the work plan. I don't think I need to go on and on too much about it because I've gone on and on before about it. <laughs> and there's plenty of materials in your uh, packets, but um, this is something that I feel is really um, a wonderful tool for local government to um, not only identify Identify that's existing within our uh, approach to uh, policy making, but to expand on in terms of how we approach uh, sustainability, public health, and equity, um, and has proven to be a great tool in many other jurisdictions. So, without without further ado, we'll turn it over to uh, Tiffany to to conduct the presentation and thank you so much for everything. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Good evening, uh, Council Members and Mayor Watkins. I'm Tiffany Wisewest, the Sustainability and Climate Action Manager for the city. <coughs> so, we come to you today following up on some direction uh, that was given by the Council on October 23rd to form a committee and to come back with uh, recommendations for future work and implementation of health and all policies in the city of Santa Cruz. Uh, the subcommittee has been formed and that consists of Mayor Watkins, Vice Mayor Cummings, and Council Member Matthews. Um, the committee has met twice to develop, to develop the work plan in front of you that is the attachment to the agenda report. And upon your approval of the work plan, they will meet monthly through the end of the year on a very discrete set of uh, tasks. And I will describe that to you in just a moment. So, what is health in all policies? That's a, a good question that we get. The definition, the formal definition, uh, is on the screen here, a collaborative approach to improving health by considering health in all decisions and across all sectors and policies. Um, it really recognizes that health is determined by physical, social, economic, uh, and service environments in which we live, work, play, age, worship. Um, it acknowledges the potential for better health outcomes or community well-being is another way that this has been thought of. Um, beyond a health agency focus, acknowledging that cities do play a role in this kind of work. Um, and this health and all policies framework makes health the linking factor to bringing people together from all sectors to identify win-win strategies to address the rooted health issues that Im impact our community in an efficient way. So a few more things about health and all policies as a framework. It's really uh, been an initiative that's built on uh, an international and historical body of work globally. Um, it's also uh, endorsed by the World Health Organization and the state of California. Here in California, 80% of healthcare dollars are spent on 20% of the population, mainly due to chronic disease management. So the goal of health and all policies is to ensure that decision makers are informed about health, public health, equity and sustainability. Those are the three pillars of health and all policy. And those consequences um, of various policy options during policy program project development processes. Health and all policies contains five key elements. I'm not gonna read these off for you, but you can, you can take a look at those. Um, I think it's really important to acknowledge that Health in All Policies is aimed at setting some intentionality to how we do business and how we make decisions um, around these three pillars of equity, public health, and uh, sustainability. And I think it's also important to acknowledge that it's done differently everywhere. It really uh, encompasses a wide spectrum of activities and can be implemented in many different ways as I'll share with you here in just a moment. 
So health and all policies has been <clears throat> implemented not only by um, other countries, states, the state of California, but also by other cities and counties, both here in California and across the United States. And again, getting to that point of, you know, what's, what is appropriate for Santa Cruz, that is something that this subcommittee is going to be looking at. But just to give you a flavor for what other cities have done, Richmond, their library department established a digital health literacy program. Um, they also have a training division that requires equity and bias training, just as a couple examples. San Francisco developed a sustainable communities index under the health and all policies framework. Monterey County has uh, implemented a health equity dialogues. They've referenced this work in their active transportation planning, as well as um, access to educational, economic, and job opportunities. Um, they also uh, looked at this in the context of redlining. Uh, so all kinds of different ways that this is, uh, you know, manifest in different organizations um, across the globe. I thought this was a really interesting graphic. It may be a little bit too difficult for you to see from here, but what you're looking at, this was uh, King County, Oregon, who also has instituted this health and all policies framework. And the upper kind of flow or the stream indicates how uh, inequities are uh, put in place through policies, practices, and systems that contribute to those inequalities. And then the, the next then would be the conditions and then the outcomes that are um, not desirable for community well-being. When you look at the bottom um, figure, this is the healthy stream that, that creates equity where policies, practices, and systems are pro-equity and thus produce the conditions that allow us to have the outcomes that we want to see in terms of increased well-being for our community. So I thought this was a, a really nice graphic to illustrate that. Um, and health and all policies already intersects with a lot of existing city work. I'm not gonna read off everything here. One of the things you talked about this evening, the Cannabis Equity Grant Program, I would also include in here. And how did I come to this? So our adaptation plan update that was adopted in October of 2018 for the first time went into detail citing public health implications of climate change. Um, and I was very interested in initiating a conversation across um, stakeholders, including public health providers, about this topic that we had not had before. Um, so again, lots already going on that intersects with these, this, these three pillars, equity, sustainability, um, and public health. And the goal of this work plan that's in front of you is really to develop a collaborative and coordinated policy and process for internal and external reflection on those three pillars and their use as factors in decision making, which in the long term would ultimately improve community well-being. So um, really uh, what we've set forth in this work plan is I think modest, and but yet achievable, and can set the stage for really longevity of this kind of concept um, going forward. And so as described, again, I won't read these off either, but as described in your um, agenda report, these are really the core action steps that have been developed by uh, the subcommittee in um, consultation with staff. Um, and uh, we think, again, this is a modest and achievable proposal. Um, fortunately, there are lots of resources available, not only case studies from many of these other organizations that I've referenced, but guides um, for health and all policies for local governments. Um, and we also um, are asking uh, for consultant help on this. We have some great local knowledge, um, as well as uh, you know the need for some materials and so forth to conduct outreach. Um, so I've asked for a small budget with this, but really we'll be um, having the consultants help staff um, take on some of the work um, that will be required in carrying out this work plan. Um, and I just wanted to share with you the objectives. Um, to I think these really highlight how 
this is m modest, but moving us forward. Again, recognizing the existing ways we're already working with these pillars, gain the support and active participation in the community. Def I think this next one is really important. Define what success looks like and what are the metrics that we need to track to make sure that we're getting to that success and how do we reassess if we aren't making progress towards the, that success. And I think the last one's also very important is that the recommendations that come out of this work add value to us as an organization, to our department directors, but also respect the demands on human and fiscal resources that are very real, as I know you're all aware of. Um, again, this is spelled out in your um, packet. And then the anticipated outcome from this year-long work plan is to bring back to council um, a report with recommendations for what's appropriate for Santa Cruz in terms of health and all uh, policies, a policy and implementation plan going forward. And so with that, uh, I just want to uh, note that we're asking for a motion um, that is a little different that's, than what's in your uh, agenda report. In addition to approving health and all policies, the work plan, we also are, are asking you to approve the $20,000 budget for consultants and materials, and we will come back with a budget adjustment at a later date um, in order to uh, appropriate those funds. Um, so with that, um, I'm you know really looking forward to the these windows of opportunity um, that will come up with the subcommittee and working with the subcommittee. Um, this very much dovetails with my work and I think um, will be uh, very valuable for us as an organization and as a community. So if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Well, thank you so much, Tiffany, for all your hard work on this and for seeing that nexus and really putting it into a nice outline and plan moving forward. I um, will turn to the council to see if there's any questions or if there's any additional comments from uh, the subcommittee me members, council members. I'm happy for you. This is your moment. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really excited. <laughs> and um, Tiffany did a great job pulling together not only health and all policies, but health, equity, and sustainability. So this is a, a good package. And um, just to reiterate, um, we think we have a lot to go with already with what we already have done and are doing in the city. So um, that's uh, a given. And we, we acknowledge the load we put on our staff for lots of projects. So the consultant help is really, um, I think, a requirement to get this delivered um, on Martine's year. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so I'm, I'm happy to go ahead and move uh, the recommendation to approve the health and all policies work plan and uh, come back with a, a $20,000 budget adjustment for consultants and materials, a one-time expense. So I'll go ahead and second that. But before maybe we do, mm -hmm. unless there's any additional questions, we'll open it up to see if yeah. any member of the public would like to address us on this item. Okay, just checking. Seeing none, we'll go ahead and return back. Sorry, Vice Mayor Cummings. No, I was just going to say that I'm excited to see this move forward and how we can apply this into a lot of the policies that we have in the city. And so uh, I just want to congratulate you on bringing this forward and, and thank you for being on the uh, committee. So. <laughs> thank you. Casey's laughing over there. I'm really excited. <laughs> I've been excited every time we meet. So it's like there's like a little, yes. I'm just, there's so much potential and possibility. So thank you, um, Councilmember Myers. And then yeah, I would just say that, um, yeah, congratulations. I think this is, uh, I mean, it's always great when California leads with innovative things and local cities and counties do it, uh, you know, and bring it back to their local jurisdiction, back, back to the neighborhood level. And, and um, we should be asking these questions because we do have, in, uh, you know, inequity in our community and we need to, to diagnose those and figure out the the ways forward to, to try to not continue in those inequ inequities. I work a lot in Monterey County and, and I've seen some of these these things make a difference there. And um, so I think I'm, I'm excited to see what, what you guys come up with. I'll also just say congratulations and thank you <laughs> to staff and everybody who's put time in to get us to this jumping off point. I'm happy um, to support the motion and the budget <laughs> adjustment. And um, just want to say that I, well, well uh, agreement uh, with um, Ms. Wise West that this is a modest proposal. Um, I do think it's going to make a, a real difference in terms of 
beginning the process of our um, incorporating this kind of lens into all of the work we do. Um, and so I'm really looking forward to seeing how that plays out. And I also hope to see um, pr uh, proposals come back to us in the future that uh, perhaps um, help us become even more proactive about um, this through our policy and, and programmatic decision making. So Great. thanks Absolutely. everybody Absolutely. and congrats. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So with that, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously with Councilmember Crone and Councilmember Glover absent. <coughs> and thank you all. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Your help. I'll, I'll just add, we just got this last week, the uh, rankings, countywide health rankings. I think I forwarded those to you. Um, uh, compiled for the state of California. We're 13 out of 58 mm -hmm. overall. And we can do better. And we and we <laughs> can too. Mind. That's yep. great. Yeah. We have a lot to go on. Absolutely. Thank you for highlighting that. And thank you, Casey and Tiffany. Okay, so we'll go ahead and return back to item number 17, which is our living wage uh, rate annual uh, prescription for 2019. And, and, and Nora, Laura Nolan is here, and I want to apologize to her because I didn't see her earlier. Oh, I'm I was, sorry, Laura. I saw you. And, uh, but she's here to, to, present. to present on this comment. So go ahead, Laura. Okay, so please, I apologize, Laura. I was looking for Marcus, and I didn't see him, so thank and you. And I didn't see her either, so. No problem. So I'm Laura Nolan. I'm the city's purchasing manager. Okay. So my, my group has been responsible for implementing the living wage because it affects primarily vendors. So if you have questions, I'm not certain um, what, I know some of the background that it got pulled off the agenda it was originally on, but I'm not certain what your questions might be this evening. Okay, we'll go ahead and see if there's any council for questions on this item at this time. Council Member Matthews. Well, basically, this is a formula. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's the question. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I don't have any questions. I'm I'm very familiar with the ordinance itself and uh, with the way that the adjustments are made every year. Um, but if there's anybody on the council who wanted more information, we have Laura here, okay. an opportunity. But I'm I'm happy to. Um, Move the recommendation. I'll we'll, that. we'll go ahead and see. So we have a motion by Councilmember Brown, second by Councilmember Myers. Is there any member of the public who'd like to address the council on this item? This is item number 17, the adjustment for the living wage annual prescription for 2019. Okay, seeing none, um, we'll go ahead and return back. So the motion is by Councilmember Brown, seconded by Councilmember Myers. Any further discussion? I just had a question. So does this only apply to um, or does this apply to nonprofit employees? No, not at the present time. It, there wasn't a way when it was um, initiated in 2001, I think we addressed that issue, and there wasn't a way to um, pay them just for the work they were doing for the city, because the nonprofit's work is blended with more than one grantor's funds. So it, it was addressed and studied pretty hard, and we weren't able to come up with a solution that would work. Although uh, at one point the city did, uh, this is years ago also, uh, allocate just overall additional funding to community programs uh, overall for the purposes of trying to help them achieve a living wage just in general, but not specifically tied to a contract. Thank you for the clarification. Okay. Okay. I just want to add, since we're saying it, it was a significant um, increase at that time. So just for council members who were not around, that happened. Yeah. Can I follow up with one more question then? Mm -hmm. um, is there any information on where that's at now? So are those nonprofit groups or nonprofit employees making wages that are comparable to these types of living wages currently? I'm not sure if there's like a central database. I know for a lot of agencies, that's something that they strive uh, to achieve within their goals. Just for example, being a, a member of the Community Bridges Board of Directors, that's something that's part of our goals and objectives. But uh, I, we can find it. I'm not sure if there's like a central uh, location or database where we can get that information as to where the different agencies might be. I don't know if you know. Okay. But I'm, I'm not aware of that. Well, what I'm aware of, uh, that I, I can say that, you know, the Human Care Alliance would mm -hmm. be the resource on this. My understanding, and I don't know what kind of uh, wage data they've been collecting, but I, I, my understanding is that they are in the process of initiating a, a study of this sort with um, um, ASR. Is it ASR? 
No, sure. not ASR. Applied <laughs> survey research. Applied yeah. survey research, yes, ASR. Um, so we may have something like that that's um, submitted to us in the future, but you could certainly ask the, the uh, Human Care Alliance what data they've got. And the we could also, we they've reached out to look at having a presentation, so we could also uh, look at agenda. Let's like do that, that in the future. That'd okay. be great. I believe, I believe also GuideStar is the other, I mean, they, they have a national database oh, where they... Um, pretty extensive uh, position descriptions and comparability across sectors in the nonprofit. More national, but it, but I believe San, uh, maybe the California Endowment might have one too for California. Sources. For top paid employees, they have those listings, and then the rest is just an aggregate across have, nonprofits. Yeah, is my, yeah. The research that I did with them. <laughs> okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, if I remember correctly, we have a motion by. Councilmember Brown, seconded by Councilmember Myers. And um, did we take the vote at this point? No. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 And uh, any opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously with Councilmember Glover and Councilmember Crone absent. Okay, so the next agenda item is um, the meeting calendar. And I'll go ahead and see if our city clerk would like to provide any updates to the calendar at this time. No, I don't have any. Okay. And uh, we don't necessarily need a motion to approve. Okay, we'll go ahead and then take a recess at this time and reconvene at 7 p.m. for oral communications. Okay. Okay, good evening, everybody. Good evening. If I could get your attention, please. Go ahead and pause, okay. Thank you, if I could get your attention. I wanna start by first asking if you have a sign to please keep it low and not to obstruct the vision of those sitting behind you. I also um, want to um, thank you for being here. This is Oral Communications and um, our 7 p.m. session on the March 26, 2019 meeting of the City Council. At this time, I'm gonna go ahead and ask our clerk to please call roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council members Crone is absent. Glover is absent. Myers? Here. Uh, Brown? Here. 
Councilmember Matthews is currently absent. Vice Mayor Cummings? Here. And Mayor Watkins? Here. If I could, I'm just gonna ask that you please keep your voices down and we'll have an opportunity to hear from each and every one of you as much as we can um, this evening. So we'll have a chance to listen to you all. I'll just briefly say oral communications is an opportunity for um, uh, for members of the community to speak to us about items that are not listed on our agenda. And I realize that there is a significant number of folks here who would like to address us this evening. Oral communications generally goes from 7 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. And generally we have a evening session. Um, we do not have an evening session this evening and as uh, the, presiding of the presider of this meeting, I will allot um, up to uh, 60 minutes for oral communications given the amount of community input um, being here. I'll briefly just read our council interactive interaction norms and um, go over sort of what the expectation of this evening will be. So the council members and the community, we ask that you please be respectful, that you engage in open and honest communication, to address uh, with truth and um, honesty, to address difficult issues, to find areas of common ground, to be open to different perspectives, to give the benefit of the doubt, to role model good leadership and to be considerate of each other's time. As the mayor, it's my responsibility that everybody has a right to uh, come and address our council, to participate in government and our democracy without threat or intimidation. And we don't have to agree with each other on everything, but we need to listen and listen respectfully when people have the opportunity to address us. Um, I'm gonna ask that we um, do things a little bit differently and that um, if you are interested in speaking for 60 seconds, generally oral communications or public comment goes for two minutes, um, that you uh, please self-select and um, come first. And if we do have additional time beyond that, then we'll open it up to two, mi two minutes. I also want you to know the expectation um, for norms. If there is a disruption and I um, am able to identify who that individual may be, I will give you a verbal warning Morning, and if it continues, then I will ask you to leave. So um, please uh, adhere to the decorum of the council meeting so that everybody has a chance to participate this evening. So with that, we'll go ahead and begin. Um, you'll have anybody who is here for oral communications that would like to address the council for one minute. We'll go ahead and start with you first, and you're welcome to uh, come forward at this time. <coughs> And you're welcome to line up on my left, okay? I, I already signed in, so um, I guess I'm the first one. Um, I'll make it one minute and I'll do it as best I can. My name is Bob Griffin. Um, I'm representing myself, my wife as local residents and also commercial property owners right adjacent to Depot Park. Um, we're at the roundabout, the first one at 302 Pacific and it's a uh, a well-known spot there in the roundabout. Uh, we've had this property for over 20 years and it's been a real challenge to have the property there with the history. So with this recent development in terms of selecting the depot site, I've talked to my <coughs> fellow commercial property owners in the area. I'm sort of halfway representing a majority of them which are in the audience. Um, we have our concerns. Quite frankly, we all feel it's a very, very poor choice. With that said, um, I'm not gonna get into the reasons of poor choice, but Depot Park serves as a park and looking, okay, thank I'm you. gonna, thank, thank you. you. Okay, next speaker, and you'll have up to 60 seconds as well. Council members, mayor, I am a mother of two girls. My daughter plays soccer at Depot Park. I'm also a physician and I work with our homeless patients on a regular basis. Based on my experience as a physician, caring for this community, I have significant health and safety concerns about the proposed depot park encampment, specifically the risk of hepatitis A, C, and methicillin-resistant staph aureus, all of which are unfortunately very common in our homeless community. Hypodermic needle, ne hypodermic needle sticks are an additional and very real he health threat. 
The proposed safe sleep and storage site will undoubtedly increase health risks for all people who use Depot Park, in particular children and the elderly, whose fragile immune systems make them the most at risk. I hope that you seize this important opportunity presented to you at this time. You have an entire community more engaged than ever to find solutions that ensure the health and safety of all of our community's citizens, whether housed or homeless. Many of us would happily donate time and money, myself included. Thank you, thank you. Um, just so the audience knows that uh, Drew is actually at his you annual. Go, if you could go ahead and pause, we can go ahead and start the clock for one minute. Okay, go ahead. Okay, sorry. Yeah, so yeah, Drew's out of town uh, teaching young people in Selma, Alabama, nonviolence. Um, the uh, thing is that there was, uh, what the audience doesn't know is that there were a lot of, alt of other alternative areas that would er were involved in Drew's attempted proposal, but because there was obstruction, the proposal did not uh, really make it to the floor or get an honest hearing. And it got whittled down by staff and by people that are, um, who some reason without real evidence rejected all the other possibilities to Depot Park. And so now, of course, it's brought out a huge number of people who believe that that was the, the whole council wanted it at Depot Park. No, there's a whole study that Drew put together with people who work and live on the streets, who work with the homeless, um, with, with city experts from other cities okay, that was never you. introduced thank into you. the city council. Yep. And that's what people don't know. All right. Hi, my name is Raphael Sonnenfeld. Uh, today, on behalf of the Friends of Depot Park, I am submitting a petition signed by over 1,500 neighbors and patrons of the park, demanding that the city stop plans for the Lot 24 encampment. I can't stress enough how poorly conceived this project is. I grew up in the neighborhood before Depot Park was created. I remember when the area was the forgotten part of town, full of trash, and as a child, sometimes not feeling comfortable to play outside in my own neighborhood. Our city has taken amazing steps to revitalize the area into a vibrant community center. Considering that Council Member Glover, who sponsored the vote for this project, now calls the Depot Park lot selection terrible and totally inappropriate and is calling for the decision to be reversed, I ask the City Council to take up a repeal of your deci decision immediately so that the years of progress we've made in improving Depot Park aren't undone. Thank you. <laughs> My name is Carol Long. I'm speaking for the Santa Cruz Climate Action Network, and we're going to each speak uh, in a row here, six of us on this one topic that um, is not on the Depot Park, and we want to get it out of the way so that you can consider the Depot Park more fully. We know that you have many uh, immediate, pressing, and very important issues to deal with. This is a request for something to help you in dealing with the issue of climate action, <laughs> since you have so much else to attend to. In view of the extreme threats to our environment and society worldwide, pursuant to the Santa Cruz City Council declaration of a climate emergency, we ask City Council to establish by ordinance an official Climate Action Advisory Commission. The commissioners will be appointed by City Council in the usual way and with the help of city staff will drive studies and recommendations to address this, the greatest emergency in our history. The commission should remain active as long as this emergency threatens us. The commission can help improve our climate action goals. Okay, your time is up. Thank you. <laughs> My name is Pam Stearns. The Commission can help improve our climate action goals. While the current basic goal of the city's climate action plan is better than non-acting, that goal, reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 80% over 1990 levels by 2050, will fall, fall far short than what is needed. According to the latest science, we have to reduce emissions to zero and start to draw down CO2 with approximately 10 years in or within approximately 10 years in order to avert climate catastrophe. For Santa Cruz, those disasters would include, according to the climate action and adaptation plans, the loss of our beaches and West Cliff Drive and almost 400 homes and 65 commercial properties by 20, by 2100, by, I'm 2100. 
Within the next 12 years alone, over 70 buildings are at risk from increased flooding due to sea level rise. Brett Garrett, continuing. Already faced with unaffordable housing, we will face a wave of migrants from areas with climates made intolerable by climate change. Our own area air quality was already compromised this past summer by wildfires, increased exponentially by climate warming. And our climate action and adaptation plans acknowledge the severe effects of unchecked climate warming on our economy. All of these are probably understatements, since every new report from the intergovernmental panel on climate change shows that previous estimates off the mark of global temperature rise and its effect on land and sea have been short of the mark. Establishing a climate commission would help to raise the issue to the level it merits. The present task force, while a laudable effort, does not have advisory power nor the power to request anything from city government, including information from various departments. The new commission would serve to reinforce the role of the city's sustainability and climate action manager. Thank you. Let him now. Okay, well, go ahead. Go ahead. Please. You'll have your opportunity to address. I would like to ask you that I will, I will consider that a warning. So please no more um, okay. speaking out of, out of turn. Okay, you'll have your, your you'll have, okay, you'll have your one minute. And no more, no more, interrum, no more interruption. Thank you, please. Every important enterprise of the city has its own department and most have citizens advisory commissions. Establishing a climate action advisory commission to help us face this relentless and monumental crisis makes sense in every way. Please put this on your agenda for speedy enactment. Thank you for all your work and for your attention. Santa Cruz Climate Action Network. So this is the time for anybody who would like to address the council within one minute. Please feel free to move forward. Good evening, my name is John Hall. I'm a voter in Santa Cruz. First thing I want to do is associate myself with the letter to the editor asking you to put the library agenda onto the city council agenda soon. I think we deserve resolution about how that's going to move ahead and where. Um, the second thing is I saw a guest commentary about realistic transportation planning that calls for something more than just looking at uh, cars and parking spaces. And I want to associate myself with that, but to go much further with it and suggest that we need to have more open public space in the downtown area. Uh, and I, as a member of the Downtown Commons Advocates, a group, a local group that's organized, I invite you all to come Friday night, this coming Friday night, at the Loudon Nelson Center for a meeting with Mark Lakeman, who's a renowned community architect from Portland, Oregon, who has done a lot to help create community spaces in cities. Thank so you. thank you. Thank you. 7 p.m. Okay, thank you. Okay. Hello. I'm Chris Olson. I um, don't really know why I'm up here, but I think I needed to speak for the homeless. I am, came from the Ross camp, and I would like to first thank everybody for, or anybody that in the community that's helped us out and brought supplies, and um, thank you for allowing me to have a safe place in the weather. Um, I'm no longer there. I actually got blessed um, over at um, the shelter. Um, but uh, I think that it's a very bad idea to try to put the homeless in that park, um, for one, because we're already um, having a war with the community, or not really war, but you know, there's already conflict with the community and it just feels like, why would you put us in the middle of more conflict? Um, and for two, um, we actually need a place, or they need a place, you know, that is not for day and night. It, it needs to be permanent, you know. How are they gonna look for a job if... Thank you. Are there any additional members of the community who would like to address the council with within the one minute timeline? Okay, we'll, we'll go to you, but we're gonna have everybody lined up on that side, but you can go ahead. <coughs> and before you do, if you could please line up to my left. Go ahead. My name is Dan Poy. 
I think you met me last week when you stated the emergency to put the 50 beds, which you're calling it 50 beds, but it's a 50 tent site um, behind my business next to the neighbors and the playground and the high school. And um, I felt like I was backed into a corner. I worked hard, I know despair. When I came here in the early 70s, I lived in my car and it, it's, it's a time that I don't wanna bring up. But I remember trying to hide and not have wrinkly clothes and make myself presentable to work. And I've worked hard to live here. And for you to put this so-called safety bed is wrong. I'll lose my business. There's gonna be um, a young man that's gonna go right after me, but uh, good evening, thank you for having me. My name is Oliver Dixon. I'm the current president of Santa Cruz City Youth Soccer Club. We are a local nonprofit organization here in town that offers recreational and competitive soccer to over 1,500 kids. And plus we have um, teams that come visit from over, over the hill and other areas. And the majority of those teams practice at Depot Park Monday through Friday. We have games every Saturday, every Sunday. We have that field booked seven days a week from now through the summer. Um, what I'd like to do is introduce Omari. He was one of the young players from our club and he has a story that he would like to share with you guys. Okay, you have one minute. Um, when me and my mom were driving near the homeless camp um, behind Ross, Someone with drugs jumped in front of our car and um, pulled down his pants and rubbed his butt on the, um, the hood of our car and laid down in front of um, our bumper and was forcing us to run over him. And I don't want that to happen again um, at Depot Park and all my summer camps are really close to Depot Park. My name is Greg Rawlings. Uh, I'm a soccer coach as well with uh, both the Santa Cruz City Club and Kirby School. Um, we practice at Depot Park uh, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays. Um, most of my players, well, about half my players ride their bike to the park and back. So, and that's a really, um, a lot of them are already nervous about this thing. My son actually wrote you guys all an email um, last night. So uh, one of you responded so far. Um, but I, I just think that there must be another place that's better than in the middle of a school or, or, or in the middle of a park or a school um, for, for this encampment. And I think everybody here understands that we need some place for the, for the homeless to go, but this is not the place. And I'll save my, the rest of my time. Hi, I'm Naima Easter and I am a soccer player and my team is Jaws 06, and we have practices at Depot Park, and um, I am really worried about the homeless people moving where my, I have practices, and um, I really do care about the homeless. Whenever like I go to Kirby, I go to Kirby, um, my school, and I always look to my um, right, and then I'm like, oh, what can I do to help them feel um, better, but, um, and this shouldn't be happening that they're moving where I enjoy having practice and I feel like it can be me playing soccer, but I can't and then my coach won't let us go to the bathroom by ourselves. at least an adult has to come with us and I don't think that should be okay. It's like the kids can deal with it, but now I can't go because I'm worried and I don't want to be worried. Thank you.
So my name is Christy Silvera. I am a home, homeowner as well as resident of Mariner's Cove. I have been the board president there off and on for years. I haven't been on the board for a little while. My husband and I work seven days a week to make sure that we can actually afford our home. And I had been followed home by a homeless back in 2010. He forced his way into my house, or tried to, but thank God I have two very large standard poodles and I was, I ended up surviving the incident. But if they wouldn't have been there and bit him trying to enter my home, it would have been indifferently. And the safety, and this is in 2010, the homeless has been so much more rapid since. And they already are quite a presence. I passed six just going from Depot Park to here. And I just took Chestnut, made a ride on church. Six homeless, and you wanna have thousands there, that's going to be a very unsafe issue. We have a drug problem in this town, not just a homeless problem. And that needs to be addressed as well. Good evening, everyone. My name is Lindsay Chester. I'm a mother and executive director of local nonprofit All About Theatre. We're located at 325 Washington Street. I'm here to basically speak on behalf of the people that are homeless as well as the families that live in this community as well. <coughs> what we're trying to figure out is a solution, and we're looking and imploring you guys to try and help us find that. Not that we're leaning on you, but we are here to help you. And I think that having hundreds and thousands of children and families being affected in a way that is fearful does not implore them to have compassion about the homeless people, but it builds that contempt and that hatred. Our community should not be built on that, especially downtown where the Loudon Nelson Community Center is, which is the heart of our community. Our children should not fear playing in our parks, and they should not fear an interaction with a homeless person. Those that are mentally disabled need help, those that have drug issues need help, and those that need a home, a roof over their heads, need some support in getting that. We've already witnessed a young lady earlier who wants to get a job, Please help them to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Coral Brune, Santa Cruz. Let's see. I'm uh, here because I'm generally overwhelmed by all the problems at Santa Cruz, but I'm also inspired by the people. I uh, heard uh, mention the community spaces idea. I really. I think that is, is a good plan to have. I also uh, have an idea about uh, uh, how we could have less greenhouse gases by uh, involving downtown to be uh, car free, uh, necessitating no need for extra parking spaces, for example, to have bicycles, and to impr improve the uh, bus uh, transportation all over town. That's a start. I would like to, uh, to be able to uh, look uh, a person in the eye and have a conversation for real downtown without fear. Thank you. Fear. <laughs> All right, our next speaker who would like to address the council within the one minute timeline. Yes, the one minute timeline. Is there any council, any folks that want, we'll go ahead and have you self select if you're interested in addressing the council within one minute. Okay. Hello, my name is Ryan St. Clair. I'm a physician here in Santa Cruz and I'm a resident of uh, Shelter Lagoon right by the Depot Park neighborhood. And I just wanted to say that I completely agree with council member Glover that the Depot Park encampment is terrible and totally inappropriate. And I really look forward to the Santa Cruz City Council voting to repeal it. Thank you very much in advance. Hello, I'm Rita Winnings. I uh, live at Mariner's Cove, which is directly across the street from Lot 24. And what I wanna share is that it is possible to care deeply about a group of people. In this case, those, those people that are camping right now at Ross Camp, and at the same time to not want a homeless camp across one's from one, the street from one's home. I'm in just that position. The people at the Ross Camp have significant problems that need to be addressed. And the health and safety issues at the camp are so great that it needs to be closed. Transferring 50 tents to Depot Park parking lot does not solve the problem. It simply transfers the burden of the problem to our neighborhood. I know that in the absence of emergency of an emergency, California law prohibits the council from discussing or taking action, immediate action on comments offered at oral communications. However, you yourselves have declared that this is an emergency. Please act tonight to repeal the resolution to bring a safe sleeping and storage program site to deeper parts. Thank you. Thank you. 
Hi, um, I'm in escrow in a house on Myrtle Avenue, one block away from lot 24, and the reason we fell in love with the house was its location. Um, we are so excited to be able to live downtown and walk places and bike places. I have a 13-year-old child, and I'm really looking forward to her being able to bike to school and to her friend's house and to the beach and the boardwalk, and all of that will change if we go forward with this. Um, I am also <coughs> realizing that you are shooting yourselves in the foot as a city. If you do this, you will be lowering, you will be raising the crime rate and you will be lowering the property values which lowers the taxes uh, received by the city. You will be ruining a lot of the tourism. It's so close to the boardwalk and people park there to be able to go to the boardwalk. You will be going backwards instead of forwards in terms of how good this city is and how many people come here and spend their money here. So I appeal to you, please repeal it. Thank you. I'm here because the public has a right to know that the city and the county have been completely complacent in allowing a harm reduction group to run a secondary, non-confidential needle exchange down at Camp Ross, and I find it very disingenuous that you would act like you care about drug addicts when you have non-medical people attending to them at Camp Ross, when we have the Emmeline campus staffed with mental health professionals, medical professionals, we have a syringe program that's running there, and instead of people being seen there and taken there to get the care they need and offered <laughs> treatment, we are delivering needles and Narcan down at Camp Ross by non-medical people, and now we have a case of wound botulism in our county, which is so rare, and why do we have that? It's unacceptable for you to sit here and be complacent and support a secondary needle exchange with no community input or ask. I'm thinking we're always gonna have a lot more NIMBYs than we're gonna have YIMBYs, no matter where we try to put them. And I think it was last week I was here and I mentioned the POGO NIP because uh, even Paul Lee, who helped set aside those acres in the POGO NIP, said that we should put the houseless people in the POGO NIP if they wanna go and make them uh, some kind of a permanent structure. Also a man, I do believe it was a man, wrote to the uh, letter to the editor in the Sentinel and mentioned Toys R Us. And uh, if I don't know if the city owns Toys R Us or if we could somehow get it, but uh, that's a, a building that we could at least put a roof over people's head in this horrible weather that we've had all winter long. Thank you. Hi. Um, I wanted to commend Vice Mayor um, Cummings for last meeting. He, um, he raised the issue of why don't we have data on who our homeless population is and that it would be a really good idea to compile that data anonymously however you can because we have a drug addiction problem, a huge one. I found a needle in front of the boardwalk last week and the public works people there told me that they found 60 last month around the wharf. Who plays around the wharf but our children and grandchildren and tourists? It's, it's just unbelievable to me that we are becoming a town that treats addicts so poorly too. You know, well, why can you hand them out needles by the handful up on the levee? And, and what are the HIPAA laws? Where's the confidentiality? These, there's young people there watching this happen. There's people riding their bikes, walking by. It triggers other addicts. Hi, thank you. This is my first time here. I am a single mother, and I didn't plan on being a single mother. I have a really good job, but unfortunately, I don't actually have enough money to afford housing here. I think probably because the influx of tech people have raised the prices. And so I want just to stand for people that um, this is going to be an ongoing problem, and not all people that are unhoused are drug addicts or um, have other the issues that people have brought up, and the characterization of people in that way is problematic. And no neighborhood is gonna want a bunch of homeless people in their yard, so you're gonna get this wherever. So I hope you find a good place though, because this is 
not just, it's just gonna keep getting worse as far as I can tell in this area because of how many people make a ton of money and um, people like me that make a pretty decent income, we don't qualify for low income anything and so we're just kind of squeezed out and so you're gonna have more people unhoused. So find a good solution. Hi, um, my name is Bridget Felder, and I'm here not because I have a problem with homeless community, but um, I think it's a lot bigger than just being homeless. Uh, my husband and I have a four-year-old daughter who plays soccer at that park. Um, she's with Kids Love Soccer. She's not quite old enough for SCCYSE yet. Um, we've had incidences where we, I won't let her go to the bathroom there anymore. She has to go before she leaves because there's people bathing in there. Um, I just worry about the safety of our youth and I feel like it's the duty of the city council to put our kids health and safety first and we need to focus more on the mental health issue with the, within the homeless community as well as the drug issue and get them rehabilitation and medication rather than just push them off and I believe that they're being evacuated because of sewage and rodent problems and disease which is just going to put that in the vicinity of our Santa Cruz youth and right now that should be a priority is the, the health and safety of the youth of Santa Cruz. Thank you. Hi, my name is Natalie and I live in the Nara Lagoon Apartments. I have a four-year-old little girl. We walk every single morning at 7.30 a.m. through the Devo Park. And I don't want her to see that kind of environment where possibly people are doing drugs right in front of her. And I also work for First Alarm at downtown Santa Cruz at Walgreens. And I constantly deal with them shooting up and being aggressive towards me. Um, I also walk home every single day, super late at night from school and work, and it would feel very unsafe to be there. And um, especially when they already recognize me from work and are constantly cussing me and yelling at me. So I don't think it's a really good idea for them to put them right by my home where I should feel safe to walk home every single night and from school. Thank, Thank you. you. My name's Aaron Singleton O'Neill. Um, I'd like to know an answer. What do you guys know about property management laundering? Or voting on uh, a group of citizens to chase me around, terrorize me, torture me? What kind of city we have here? Okay. Well, you guys should be ashamed of yourself, and I'm going to just really kick the hell out of the city because of this. Okay. My name is Barry Kirshen, and I'm a Beach Hill neighbor of Depot Park, and uh, I'm here tonight to express my disappointment in the lack of public process opportunities for neighbors to weigh in. Um, before a decision was made, uh, I, I recall uh, hearing about the, the sites that you were considering a couple weeks ago. And my reaction was that, that none of them were appropriate uh, and certainly not uh, Depot Park. Thank you. My name is Jane Real, and I'm a homeowner and resident in the Neary Lagoon area. And I was really upset and shocked to hear the news that a decision was made without any public input to um, move uh, some homeless people into a parking lot. And uh, that depot area and that parking lot and the train tracks is our only access to the beach area. That is how our children cross to get to the boardwalk, to get to the beach. And every day, evening and morning, and, there, and that is just, there's already, we cannot go under the trestle because there's so many drug addicts and so much illicit behavior happening in that area that is not being monitored. And I'm wondering, you know, a parking lot is not a home. It is not, it is not a dignified place for people to have live and be sheltered. And it is not a solution for, for the homeless and for us, and where are they gonna go in the day? Hi, 
my name's Debbie Dutra, and I'm an All About Theater parent. Um, my daughter goes to All About Theater on Washington Street. We have about 500 kids that go through that theater from age three to 16 every single year. Um, they walk from All About Theater, they walk to Loudon Nelson. We have all of our shows at Loudon. We try to teach our children compassion. Um, they say they're aware of the homeless problem. We have to sometimes even clean up the defecation before we can even do our sets or anything else. They're, it's, it's, it's very challenging as it is, and like the last woman said, I am concerned. Yes, sleep, safe sleeping, I get it. What happens when it's dawn? Where are they going? And that's my biggest concern. And I have two young ladies here after me that I'd like to introduce, and they're um, two of the theater kids. So that, that's what I'd like the answers with that, is what, what, is, what, is, what, is your, what is the solution for the daytime? So, thank you. I'm Sophia Rourke. Hi, I'm Olivia. And um, All About Theater is right near where the homeless camp is going to be. And All About Theater is always supposed to be called a safe place. And I don't think we feel that comfortable when the homeless camp is near um, All About Theater. And it's not that homeless people aren't safe, but. Um, All About Theater is supposed since it's supposed to be a safe place um homeless people because the teens when um it's break time for them they get to go out if they want to and it's usually dark right then so i don't think we'll feel comfortable when <coughs> they're right near us <coughs> and yeah thank you Hi, my name is Penny Bankson, and I'm the race director of the first triathlon that comes to town in August um, at Depot Park. And the next one is an Ironman followed by the Santa Cruz Triathlon or the Sentinel. And over the last 12, 13 years, we have seen the situation down there deteriorate greatly. Last year alone, we picked up 22 needles, three bottles of urine, and several piles of excrement from the plaza in Depot Park overnight in spite of a security guard. We have had equipment stolen. Our vendors have had equipment stolen. We have had computers stolen. And probably the worst of all, when we asked one gentleman to leave, he peed all over the racer's food and rendered it unusable. 80% of the people who come to use Depot Park and the beach area come from out of town. They've had their cars broken into. Um, and, and this is just ongoing, not new. Hi, my name is Seth Van Horn. Um, I'm a father here in town, a resident. Uh, I've grown up in Santa Cruz my whole life, so I've seen this town change um, a lot over the last almost 40 years or so. Um, it used to be a safe place that I could run around and feel safe at night, um, biking around and doing all of those things. Um, I wouldn't even feel safe with my child going a block from my house. Um, I live a block from Depot Park, and me and my wife take our son through the lagoon every single week to go up to the playground and play. And that used to be such a peaceful, tranquil place for us to unwind and go take our kid to. Um, now, every single time we pass through, we can expect to walk up on somebody with their crinkled, burnt piece of foil and their needle and their spoon, trying to roast up somewhere on a little park bench. And we get solicited for drugs by people that come through offering drugs to anybody walking down the paths. And these aren't things that we want to have to explain to our kid every single time we're walking by. And the camp isn't even there yet. And that's not gonna make anything any better. It's destroying the natural wildlife and the whole scene there. And the nail, it's empty out there. Hi, my name is Marina Iyer, and I spoke last week um, about my idea for a 10-year plan for Santa Cruz. My idea um, to help with Depot Park that we can do in the interim is uh, I would love for the city council to look at real estate, commercial real estate that the city can buy with the funds for the homeless money to find a shelter, an area that they can be housed in day and night. Um, preferably, I, I even looked online and I found something I will give to you, a commercial site. Um, also, in the future, to think about making 
um, deals with uh, failing motels down at the beach flats and convert those into um, housing for the homeless. And as part of it, I also have the ideas for drug-free Santa Cruz because they need to go hand in hand. It can't, you just can't give the housing without upping, hiring more police, enforcing drug laws, um, making chop shops illegal. I'll, can You're I, welcome to do that, yeah. So I'll go ahead and increase the time to two minutes for the remainder of oral communications, which is an additional 18 minutes or so at this point. Okay, you'll have up to two minutes. Hi, my name is Mrs. Gomez, and we're coming from the from Niri Lagoon apartment. We got a 217 signature house by house. Everybody, children, seniors, disabled, people that can't even don't move the hand, they sign it. So it's here. So we're coming to say, please open the agenda to agree some suggestion for the for the city council for the April second for the next one for April seven. So we want to say thank you, uh, Mr. John uh, uh, Justin coming. I have some papers in my house say, uh, Justin coming is a really compassionate solution for homeless. So we say, please, we want to please a beach, a shelter be reopened or place a one safe place for them where they can be you not know, surrounded for res resident homes, children. Um, there's a lot of uh, all the people over there. We have it here all the data and the signature. So uh, also it's a problem for the, uh, the train, the homeland security, who can say to us the homeland security. So and also we want to uh, we want to open the agenda for April 2nd to April 9th. Uh, all the people feel in their heart that there be some solution and open the agenda. It's only seven, seven people here. So we want to remember the proposition to for mental health, two million dollars. In 2004, 63, one five to two five million dollars. In proposition H, affordable housing for the uh, first home buyer, et cetera, but experience homeless mental illness, they should be in the proposition H. Proposition 10, rent control, helping to the other people to get an apartment because they don't have even though for homeless or no homeless. And proposition 5 for a 55 years order. So at the same time, we want to say, we found in the newspaper, the lady from Scrass Valley, the, uh, she said, okay, is the, one moment. Okay, she is the Association for the Faith, uh, Susan McLean, she is from, uh, from Scass Valley. Why does she want to bring the people from Scass Valley and the faith, and what kind of faith, to, to, the, to our neighborhood? Thank you. Thank you, and open, okay. open the agenda, please. Okay, next my, speaker, my here have to I have more paper here, but anyways. Oh, I can hand my, my one 207 signature. Oh, they say, fulfill your promise, I'll vote you. Okay, no you've had your moment. It's now time for the next speaker. Thank you very much. You'll have up to two minutes. Thank you. Hi, I'm Garrett. Uh, please commit to the public your mission is not to turn Santa Cruz into a haven for the poor and homeless, but to prosperity, which can better afford those. We don't need an L.A. style skid row. I see no acknowledgement that homeless is a national problem that cannot or futilely be attempted to be solved by a small city any more than what is practical, does not invite more homeless here, and only in the interests and desires of all the people of Santa Cruz. I see no acknowledgement that there exists a large percentage of homeless, such as those with mental issues, permanent willful drug addiction and grifters, that will take up service slots permanently, and that this process continues in a positive feedback loop as more services are added, no matter the amount of services offered, as they have unlimited numbers of such people free to travel where they may. I see no acknowledgement that this is a field of dreams. Provide more service and they'll come, filling more and more with a permanent, ever-growing element of such. I see no acknowledgement that the idea of 100% shelter is somehow required or a goal we should try to achieve. If it were ever accomplished, the homeless from hundreds of miles away would come in droves. 
I'm uncomfortable having religious groups take vast sums of money and work for the city. That's counter to the separation of church and state. I'm uncomfortable with dispersing vast sums of emergency money to NGOs whose stated missions transcend that homeless purpose without a complete public accounting of their success at reducing homelessness at what cost. I am uncomfortable with public land right permanent giveaways without a complete public accounting of their success at reducing homelessness at what cost, and land costs plenty. It counts and it belongs to all the people. I see no acknowledgement that there exists a too many homeless problem that affects all people while homelessness affects 1.85%, a number far too large for this small city. No one here seems to have a number that is too many. You should pick a number. Thank you, thank you. Hello, Elise Casby, dear Santa Cruz City Council and other concerned citizens. The tweet that Police Chief Bills tweeted, directing the public to view the video called Seattle Dying is seen by myself and others as promoting a deleterious view of people experiencing homelessness. Chief Mills tweeted this message and picture on the video on Tuesday, March 19th, 2019. The video is not responsible journalism, but heavily biased against an already vulnerable group of people attempting to survive without housing and lacking in viable shelter options that are truly accessible to many in the group. Police Chief Mills tweet comes at a time when Santa Cruz is embarking on changes in policy to provide potentially a legal sleeping spot in a limited pilot program to people experiencing homelessness. I hope I am correct in my understanding of the city's current recommendation as I express it here. The video fully equates homelessness with property crimes, drug use, and mental illness in a blanket manner. The video correlates homeless people with images of garbage and blight. The video also recommends in an indirect way that stronger policing would be thus a solution to the problem, if not the solution to the problem. This is a kind of political suggestion for a solution to the so-called problem of homelessness that the police chief is suggesting by his reference to the video in his tweet. I want to call your attention to the, this use of media by a person in a very particular position of authority in our city as I believe it is irresponsible use of media by our police chief and serves to further dehumanize an already vulnerable and diverse group of people, people experiencing homelessness. Promoting this type of media Bi bias media in a way that depicts people attempting to survive outside does not help our community find our way to constructive solutions, especially when that promotion is done by our chief of police. And I have packets here for each of you. It has the tweet with the picture, a letter from me, and a piece from Good Times. Well, there you go. Thank you. Hi, my name is Shivani Patel. I'm currently a sophomore at Santa Cruz High School. My school and my home are both very close to the encampment if it were to move. Um, I wish to speak to you guys today about two of encounters that I've faced in the two years of high school that I've had walking back home. These encampments both happened on the same sidewalk. I was walking one day, I was very close to my home when I had a 60 year old man who's homeless approach me, speaking things that were inaudible to me, things that seemed like gibberish to me, and I was able to get away. But who knows what would have happened to me in that situation? What if he was armed? I felt incredibly unsafe, and that was very scarring to me. My second encounter was even more scarring than that. I was around in the exact same spot. A homeless woman was next to me, and at the sidewalk parallel to me was a high school student around my age. This homeless lady was talking to me about the thighs, the legs, the body, the curves of that high school student who was across the sidewalk from me. And that just made me so uncomfortable. Who wants to hear that about anybody else? It, it's, I, I, I don't even have words. But I wish to ask you all something. When is it ever okay to compromise the safety of one group of individuals for another group. It's never okay. And I wish you guys to put yourselves in the shoes of the very concerned parents sitting behind me. They're concerned for their safety and above all the safety of their children. So many people walk home every day from school. People who are half my age who would have to face this. And it's never okay. If you can't put yourself in the shoes, 
of those concerned parents, and I'm sorry to say, but with all due respect, our priorities as a city are backwards. Thank you. I'm asking you tonight to lead our city, to build consensus and effectively problem solve our tough issues. I want to solve the drug and crime issues, but when I or my neighbors call the police, we're often ignored and told to just fill out a form online. I want to solve the homelessness issues with you, but when I ask you to not just kick the camp down the road to Depot Park, you dismiss me as a NIMBY. When I appropriately question the common sense and effectiveness of creating a homeless camp in a neighborhood park, you oversimplify and label me as not compassionate. I'm asking you tonight to start leading and stop oversimplifying, stop ignoring, dismissing, and labeling not only me, but also our homeless people, and begin to do the hard work to help all people in our community on this very complicated issue. Find out who our homeless are in Santa Cruz, who needs help with a livable wage or subsidized housing, who needs treatment for their addiction, who needs health care for their mental health. And let's work with the minds and resources at the county, state, and national levels on this challenging national issue. We really need their help on this. My trust in your leadership is broken. When you ignore public comment that goes till 1 a.m., 12 a.m., of course you're going to get the same responses in the next neighborhood. When you rush and you confusingly put the homeless camp issue on a special agenda or take a page from national politics to declare an emergency, it looks calculating, not consensus building. When your stated intent is to set up a 24-7 transitional camp, not a temporary camp, I don't trust your temporary overnight camp. When you show us models of transitional camps without drugs and alcohol, and the city council members say that isn't practical in Santa Cruz, that we need wet transitional camps, then I beg you to begin leading with problems. I'm so sorry, I'm so nervous. I beg you to begin leading and problem solving with common sense. Restore my trust and do not kick the camp down the road to Depot Park. Lot 24 is not a constructive solution to this complex issue. It's the wrong program in the wrong place, and I really urge you to reconsider this. Thank you. Council Mayor, my name is Brent Adams. I'm the director of the Warming Center program, and I operate a storage program for 400 people who sleep outside. I have 80 people sleeping on the floor. I have a very high level of contact with people who sleep outside. Um, I'm not going to tell you ever what they think. Anybody who tries to tell you what homeless people think and what they're going to go for is, a, is, is not uh, being authentic. But I will tell you, we're all being duped by the city manager's office. They're duping us. We're all being played like a game, and the city council are pawns in this game. We, we know what's up. Wherever money is pooling, that's where we'll see action. This is our second drug camp in a row. The city let, let this happen. They're, they, they, we never had them ever apologize. We watched it grow. We watched syringes, and they used that like they did last year to do that camp on uh, River Street. They, 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 they let, it, let the tide come in and, ra and ratchet the population up. What we've done now is we've laid a population of incredible drug addiction on top of our pre-existing homeless population. People have streamed from out of town, and what have we heard them say? They've never even blinked. I am so frustrated. frustrated. And now we're like raising up possibilities like transitional encampments and then getting the population riled up. We know, we know this is not going to happen. What's really happening is 10 million. We just want you to all be placated later like the River Street Camp. Nobody's protesting the River Street Camp this year because they pushed us so far. We're, we're willing to accept anything, even uh, tents in a, in, a, in a downtown parking lot. I, I, I think we should out rise up. I am, I am completely upset. If we were really going to do something about homelessness, you would have actually had month meetings ahead of time, like you said you were going to do with transitional encampments. Martin Bernal, you know this. You didn't. You denied tr uh, what? You denied these meetings, and, and so you're you're abusing this population. I can raise my voice, and I will. I, I operate you the warming ahead. center. I'm gonna, I'm gonna I, you, I, I'm gonna, I put. I paused your time. I I'm going to go ahead and ask you to please direct your comments. To I, I will. This I put, is our oral uh, sorry, I put forth the transitional encampment process, and it's been denied through rumors and innuendo. I'm actually uh, watching this over many years now, and I actually okay. see your this this, this this sham. Thank you. I, um, I think this um, 
perception of who our homeless community is, is uh, at least five or 10 years in the making. And I put a lot of it on our former police chief, Kevin Vogel and deputy chief, Steve Clark. They held an event at Holy Cross <coughs> Church that was an embarrassment, it was a travesty, it was a sham. They trucked in a woman from Sacramento whose mother had been murdered, no surprise, by a homeless person. The woman that was a, 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 a public safety advocate was a sham, she was a fake. Her website was removed, she's a complete fraud. They couldn't even scope that out. So now we have Chief Mills sharing the same hyperbole. He has said numerous times, you cannot compare jurisdictions and crime, and in that false video, there's a demogra there's a um, dial uh, diagram of Seattle's crime compared to Compton and New York, and it's a travesty. Seattle's crime is just like California's, it's near historic lows. Some of the crimes recently in our community, a neurosurgeon, a neurosurgeon molesting children, not homeless. A police officer shooting a man with a rake, not homeless. A police officer who was just fired for groping and sexually assaulting people who may have to register as a, a sex offender, not homeless. A Girl Scout, a camp counselor, not homeless. So pre creating this um, emotion of fear is gonna make it really hard for anybody to put this population in any campground, any transitional six month, nine month, 30 day. What I also wanna switch gears to is I wanna provide with you, and I will get the electronic link for this. This is the Stephanie Fiore's presentation on overdose data, and she did a really amazing job from 2008 to 2018. We have a substance use disorder <coughs> issue, yes. I do not use the word addict, I use people who use drugs. I do not um, ignore the fact that we're in the middle of an epidemic and it's an overdose epidemic. If anybody complains about giving out naloxone, which the Surgeon General has recommended, which the CDC has recommended, your time is up. they Thank have you. discrimination uh, issues. We have an, enough time for maybe a couple more speakers. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Jennifer Lanford Brown, and I'm here to um, kind of uh, counteract some misinformation that um, a fellow nurse is presenting. Her name is Melissa. Um, we at the harm Redu for harm reduction coalition nationally. We um, promote safe health, and we um, do outreach. And it's not necessarily a syringe exchange program. We take in dirty uh, used syringes, but what we do is provide access and promote access. We give rides to um, the clinic, we give hours to the clinic to try to get people to use the um, you know, exchange program. We even, I even do field trips. I live on Felker Street, so I live right by the camp. Um, I'm trained, and I am trained to train the trainer in Narcan scope training. Um, I'm an advanced medic certified. I, I've done a lot, but that's not just it. People aren't accessing the program, and they're using dirty needles, and they're infectious diseases that are going to spread. They're getting abscesses. They need help and direction, and sometimes they just need to be told what time it is, and let's field trip it up on Tuesday night. I walked bunch of people who wouldn't access the program and I went in for them. So I'm asking you guys to understand the health and safety code 11364.7 of state of California says that injection drug users can do their own secondary exchange. So if it's not us, it's them. And we I'd rather us do it because we make sure we take in thousands of needles. Thank you. Okay, so we'll go ahead and allow for one more speaker to come on up, and you will be our last speaker. I, I'm, no. si I'm sitting here because I can't stand. Similarly here. <coughs> okay, we'll have you, and then if you could notify me in advance that you're in line, because we've had folks waiting in line that... I didn't get the notice. Okay, well, we'll go ahead and have it just because of the fact that you weren't unable to stand. You two will be, I, I suppose, the last speakers, but you can go ahead and then. I'm gonna go ahead and close it. I doubled the time for oral communications. We've received numerous emails. You're welcome to email us and continue. I apologize, I know many people wanted to speak tonight. We'll go ahead and extend it for the remaining three speakers. Go ahead. Thank you. Martine, I was at a 
party with you at my best friend Laura McLeod's house when you were being elected. We had a really nice conversation actually about this. And I, I'm sorry to you guys, I didn't have an intention to speak tonight. I just wanted to come in here because I <coughs> live two blocks from Depot Park. <coughs> and I just wanted to say that I'm sorry this fell into your lap when you were elected. This has to be horrible. And it's a community problem. We're all scared, we're all worried. We all don't want it, you don't want it. So I, I want us to all work together and I know that you want that too because I know what you stand for and you're a really great woman and I voted for you and I'm glad that you're here. But I just, my biggest concern is we live there. This one is terrified, terrified to go anywhere downtown. We don't go, we live on Lincoln Street. Um, and oh. we've lived here 22 years from New York and this is by far, as you know, again, I'm not saying anything you guys don't know. It's super scary and I just don't know where the police are in any of this. Like I get a parking ticket in front of my own house because I haven't paid my permit parking, but I just, I, I, I don't know why I'm, you know, I'm like the criminal in this town and I pay a lot of money to live here as do all of these people we pay premium prices to live here and in our backyard we have horrible scary really sick drug addict and it is a drug epidemic it's it's more than a homeless epidemic because I don't know that most of the homeless veterans and I can't speak for this I don't know that they would set foot in these camps they're they're terrible, it's horrible. I do feel s s awful for all of you that this is happening and I just hope we can work together and I do hope that the police get a little more um, okay to, to help. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Ms. We'll go ahead and have you, M Mr. Norris. All right, okay. Hi, I'm Abby. About eight years ago, um, I was also, I don't know if you know this, but I was also extremely afraid of people that were living on the streets, very afraid. I couldn't look at them in the eyes because the, my reasoning was they wanted something from me and I was, I didn't wanna start a conversation, I was afraid, there's multiple reasons. Um, but I decided, I. I I, at one Christmas, I started handing out, giving out food. And that Christmas changed my life at the vet center. And what happened was, I, it was unbelievable. People were saying, God bless you. Everyone, almost everyone say, God bless you for a piece of food. And I experienced this all the time. And what's changed for me is now I have found more humanity in the people at the camp and I am willing to stay there for one week straight every single night, I promise. I've gone to that camp, I speak to the people, I feel extremely safe. So I think that people are afraid of what they don't know, just like I was eight years ago. And I feel more humanity with the people in the camp and what uh, they're more alive and in touch with life. Whereas we're in our, most of us, including myself, a lot of the time are at home in their safe environment with the TV or whatever's going on where I, I get lost into what's um, the, the moving of life. And I do not agree that most of the people at the camp are drug addicts. Um, I do not, uh, Seattle, I've been talking to people in Seattle, city council people, and looking up statistics, and there's opposing sides where people say that the, the crime has gone up and the crime has stayed the same. I know you're gonna cut me off, thank you. Okay. Um, I noticed that no one who's spoken here in opposition to the depot camp, and I'm no fan, of the depot camp myself, mind you. It's not an encampment, it's a, it's a nighttime only proposal. But no one except for one speaker has offered an alternative spot. So we, what we're really saying is, 
Get the fuck out of town. Excuse That's me, what's I, really I being said here. Comment. I want to remind you that there's children in the audience. I understand. And I want to and ask the kind that you of please bigotry keep, that is being pushed here is not particularly healthy for children, keep, in my view. Okay. If you could keep, okay? you, you you could continue that? your conversation. That's comment. bigotry. That's dangerous stuff. You have a mob of people here who are believing in fantasies, dangerous, paranoid fantasies about people who are in trouble, some of whom are drug using. Yes. <sighs> What do we got? As far as the Ross Camp Depot Park issue, it's pretty clear. Driving people out of Ross Camp into the streets, sidewalks, parks, green belts, and residential neighborhoods, which is what's going to happen, folks, if they close the Ross Camp on April 17th. Our city manager has already declared that on the 10th he's going to start clearing out the camp with no place for people to go, fundamentally, okay? That's the point. So what you need to do is acknowledge this. The $90,000 per month River Street Camp for 60 people, no. Even if the depot site continues, which I don't think it's going to, given this outcry, and I understand it, uh, it it's not going to be available for enough people in that camp. So. What have we got? The community needs to come up with its own solutions. Everyone's invited to the Resource Center for Nonviolence, April 3rd, 7 p.m. Of all kinds of views, opposing the depot, opposing the homeless, whatever you oppose, this is a community problem, as many speakers have said. Now, anyone who'd like to speak on free radio, and I've been running around with my little machine here recording some dialogues and some opinions, apologize I haven't gotten to everybody, I'm interested in your view, contact me. I've given out this flyer in case you want my number. We'll put you on the air. Whatever you view, we need real dialogue and real action. The only viable place right now, however crowded and wretched, is Ross Camp. Okay. The only Thank realistic alternative up. tonight. Your time is up. Okay. That's what we got. We'll go ahead and um, at this time conclude oral communications. And um, Councilmember Matthews. If I could, I think this is time for council comments. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, I would like to make a, a very personal comment, actually, um, in response to this evening and what's led up to it. I mean, this is obviously an extremely painful situation that our community finds itself out, finds itself in. There's the human suffering that we see associated with homelessness in its many forms, and virtually everyone has acknowledged that this evening. Uh, we also see the impact and the fear that surrounds this issue. We have a tense and divisive feeling in the community um, that's disturbing to all of us. And I personally find it very difficult to, because this is an area in which I've personally been active for many decades, worked hard for the creation of the soccer field, of Depot Park, of the Loudon Nelson Community Center, the high school, so many of the facilities that our community, so it's not just the neighborhood, it's the broader community that uses these facilities. And someone spoke earlier in oral communications about public spaces and town commons. I know how important those are to our community. So it's not just this neighborhood, it's the broader community. But I've also worked with this neighborhood for decades with a, a variety of impacts and cr trying to deal constructively with things like traffic, party houses, crime, and yes, there has been a very real impact of homelessness and crime, not that they're intrinsically linked, but they do co-occur in this area. That's real. We heard experiences of people going back to five and more years. Um, that's already an issue in this neighborhood. I want to speak a little bit about the context <coughs> of tonight's discussion. We have an urgency to act. I think specifically we acknowledge that the Ross Camp poses extreme public health and public safety concerns. We have, as a city, serious legal considerations to confront. We have built, for the first time in my memory, a working collaborative relationship with the county in trying to deal with this issue. And um, I am interested in continuing that collaborative work in a broad response to homelessness with a focus on shelter, transition, and long-term solutions. Our actions in the last few months have been, I think, rushed and chaotic. They have not given us time to focus on effective action, and they have placed extreme demands on our staff who have honestly been doing their best um, to 
uh, respond to one directive after another thrown at them. It's uh, created, I think, more anxiety uh, than it needed to. Uh, last week, I offered some amendments to a motion um, that was made um, by Mr. Glover, he's not here. Uh, my motions, my amendments were intended to make a bad idea somewhat less bad. That was my attempt. Um, and uh, it's true that we did not have time for necessary outreach or analysis of the uh, options that were presented to us. Since that council meeting, I have met with dozens and dozens of residents and neighbors and those who use the facilities. I say it's not just the neighbors, it's the people who use the parks, the, the playgrounds, um, Loudon Nelson Center. It's, it's a vast range of our community. I've listened to their concerns about the um, proposed use at Lot 24. I do wanna say also that your presence here tonight and your letters count. Uh, we can't possibly respond to all of them, but we, we read them and they make a difference. I realize that we cannot place a, a, a function, a camp of this nature that's been proposed um, next uh, in lot 24, next to the park in this neighborhood affecting all the many users. I believe we have to revisit the issue and find a better alternative that includes community engagement. Also, recent information that we've obtained from city staff and our city attorney lead me to believe that the proposal for Lot 24 is even more problematical than was first described. I've given this a lot of thought. Those of you who know me <laughs> probably know that this has weighed really heavily on me this past week. Um, and I believe that uh, for the neighborhood and all those who use the surrounding community facilities, parks, schools, playgrounds, the community center, um, that for them, uh, we need to change course. I want to acknowledge that the process to, to up to this point did not involve the kind of community outreach that it should have. We didn't seek proper input. We did not adequately engage the neighbors or the facility users before um, giving direction to place this camp at lot four, 24. As a council member, uh, one of the most important jobs we have is to ensure community outreach and consider it. And we did not do an adequate job. I think it's clear to everyone that on this particular subject, it's not easy. But I will no longer support the uh, action we approved last well, week. Councilman Matthews, I'm gonna yes. go ahead and pause for a second. Um, Mr. Kondati. Just wanna caution the council that yes. this is not an item on your agenda I, tonight. I, yeah. You cannot take action um, this evening. Um, however, the council could direct that an item be agendized for consideration at a future meeting. Okay, that's my next line. <laughs> oh, there you have it. Okay, <laughs> and I, I just, I, yes, because, thank you. Because there has been substantial commentary and unfortunately this is not an opportunity that's for right. the and whole council to have a big discussion about this because it's not agendized. So that's it should right. be um, agendized for consideration at a upcoming okay. meeting. It sounds like that's the direction <coughs> and that's something I would be supportive of. So feel free to go ahead. Yes, thank you. And I, I did want to stress some of you are familiar with our processes, some not so much, but um, we can only take action on an item that has been on a published agenda. And the meeting tonight was only agendized as oral communications. So we can't take action on a specific item, but we can give direction to agenda something for a future meeting, and that's what the city attorney was reminding us of. Thank you. Um, so given that, um, I would uh, like to make uh, the following motion that um, at our next meeting scheduled for April 9th, an item be placed on the agenda for the council to consider and take action on two issues. First, the disposition and closure plan of the Ross camp and secondly, rescind the designation of city lot 24 for a homeless site, homeless uh, shelter or camping site. And that this discussion and action occur in open session. Okay, so I'll that's, second that's that motion. my motion.
We'll go ahead. I will second the motion. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't want to go too far off uh, for um, uh, to be in compliance with the uh, Brown Act here on this. And I just will say that I'm committed to solutions, interim, long-term solutions, um, working with the two by two, as I've said in the past, and um, would be happy to re-agendize that to affirm my um, initial re response, which was mm -hmm. not to support that moving forward. Okay, Council Member uh, Brown and then. So I won't um, repeat with a, my own statement the um, what was said by Council Member Matthews. I agree wholeheartedly. I was I saw some of you on <coughs> Sunday out at the park. I've had individual conversations and communications with folks that have suggested that I have similar um, interests and I am going to support the motion. I just want to clarify that when you said for the purpose of the motion, rescind your, the, the motion would, I think the appropriate language would be consider rescinding, right? Because we're not voting tonight. So it's, it's simply to consider rescinding. That word is in there. That okay. we could, in the beginning of the sentence, it's consider and take action. Thank you. In the future. Thank you. I just wanted to clarify that. Um, and I think that was all I have for now. I too am committed to, um, you know, and there were a lot of people I talked with and others who have, have communicated with us who do um, suggest that they want to be involved in the conversation moving forward. So I really want to um, encourage you all to, to do that. And I hope that we create some spaces to have those dialogues um, because we do want to work with the community as we move forward. Okay. okay. I'm looking for City Attorney Condotti. Do you have any? In, input on this at this point. Um, that I, comment. I, I don't believe so. I, I think final comments are appropriate. appropriate. Okay. Um, but they should be directed to the motion, which is to agendize. Agendize. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Councilmember Mayer. Yeah, I just wanted to thank everyone for coming out and your comments tonight. I did not vote for the proposed depot site or the emergency declaration last week. Uh, I feel like the focus that has taken us to this place of transitional encampments and safe sleeping areas has been rushed on this community. And in my opinion, that is not serving either the unsheltered population or our neighborhoods and community at this time. So I am very happy with um, to support the motion. Uh, I feel like we have to stop pushing the actions on our community. We need to slow things down and do the work to inform our community right now both about our efforts and um, about our unsheltered population and the kinds of complexities that we as policymakers are really trying to struggle with. Um, I appreciate everyone who wants to help us solve probably the most complex problem that we will face in a generation. This is, this is something I don't think our nation has ever faced. And so <laughs> we're one of many cities trying to, trying to figure this out. But I believe strongly that rushing will not get us there, that we will not succeed unless we are thoughtful, deliberative, and communicate. So many of you asked us tonight to lead, and you are exactly right in asking us to do that. And we need to lead collectively, and I will be committed to doing that for you. And uh, I know our fe my fellow council members share, share many of these same, same uh, objectives. So thank you, everybody, for coming out. So I wanna start by thanking everyone for coming out tonight. Um, as many of you have noticed, I'm sick and I've made it a point to be here, um, to hear from you all and to uh, be up here to help make decisions that are important for our community. Um, I as well didn't vote on um, what was proposed last week as someone who is a soccer player or a, form, a former soccer player. Um, I will say that, um, and someone who passes by that site, I see how, how often it's used um, by our community, by children. Um, I see how that area as a corridor for people to get to the beach and access some of our main tourist areas is very important for our community. Um, so those are a number of the reasons why I didn't support the decision that was made last week. Um, but one thing I wanna point out, and this is kind of touching on what people have been saying and I've been hearing over the past few weeks, um, is that you know Santa Cruz is inviting people to our community to um, engage in illegal behavior, whether that's drug use or theft. Uh, and I just wanna point out that this is something, if 
There's a movie, you know, about Seattle. I just want to point out that this is also happening up and down the entire West Coast. And if you think about many of the major cities, it's happening across our entire country. I mean, we are in a point right now where we have one of the worst opioid crises in our nation's history. It's nothing that we've experienced before. And so it is time that we have to start thinking about new solutions. We also have legal constraints now that we didn't have before. Um, Previously, cities may, may have been able to just ask homeless people to leave or make them move when they were sleeping, and we cannot do that anymore. That is a violation of the Eighth Amendment, which is cruel and unusual punishment. So we, we cannot just think that we can push along the problem. We really need for people in our community to come together and start coming up with solutions. And I know that um, council members um, Glover and Crone aren't here, but I, one thing I do know is that they both very much care about um, the homeless and they want to find solutions to this. And I do think that the way that we went about first introducing these measures was rushed. And I think we do need more community input, but that's what we're asking you for at this time. Um, we, we understand your frustration, we hear your fears, but now we need you to, but we brought options forward and we understand that those options aren't good for many members of the community, so we need insight as to you know, what some other alternatives would be. And we don't have jurisdiction over what can be placed in the county. I'll just put that out there. So we're also working with our county supervisors to figure out where locations in the city and throughout the county, and I encourage you all to reach out to them as well. This time, I'm just going to go ahead and um, make a few final comments. Um, I, too, really just would echo a lot of what has been brought up by my colleagues here tonight. I um, am committed to solutions. We definitely need to think how we're going to address this really um, challenging uh, situation happening in our community with our community partners, with our county partners, with our business sector, with our nonprofit community, with our faith-based community. This is a societal issue that we need to look at how we can collaboratively work on together. I also recognize that, you know, we have a very visible homeless population that we see every day for some of us that go um, by the Gateway Encampment. And although a very visible population, we have also a very um, invisible population of homelessness. And in education, I'm coming from an education background, I want to remind you of all the number of uh, other subpopulations of homelessness, the homeless children, the transitioning foster age youth in our community. Uh, the uh, sometimes hundreds and thousands of, of folks that are struggling in our community. So yes, it is a uh, very complex issue that's going to require complex uh, responses, and it will require us all working together. I also just really want to um, acknowledge and uh, thank uh, Councilmember Matthews for uh, agendizing this uh, to come back for reconsideration. Um, uh, similar to Councilmember Myers, I didn't originally support this as a proposal, nor did I support the emergency declaration modifications. Um, I feel policy in, uh, in has to be inclusive of community input, has to be founded in data, needs to have a, a broad understanding of unintended consequences and uh, a way to track interventions and have some accountability. That's how I like to look at all policy decisions. And for me, that didn't meet that threshold. And I recognize that it also caught our community by surprise. Uh, and I apologize uh, for that uh, to you all. And um, moving forward, uh, really will uh, commit to working with our colleagues and our city staff and our partners to come up with more uh, inclusive solutions at this time. So clearly this is a conversation that will continue. I want to thank you all for coming out this evening. Um, I really realized that this was not agendized. We had a very long uh, oral communications, uh, longer than usual, um, but I appreciate you uh, allowing that extended time with us this evening uh, so that we could have this conversation. So at this time, I will go ahead and adjourn the meeting and, uh, oh, forgive me. We have a motion by Councilmember Matthews, seconded by myself, and we'll uh, take a vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously with Councilmember Crone and Councilmember Glover not present this evening. So now we'll go ahead and adjourn the meeting. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.